States, as well as the associated public health implications. The chair now recognizes herself for the purposes of an opening statement. Today, we're here again to continue our examination of a growing public health crisis, the soaring use of e-cigarettes by young people. Simply put, our nation faces a youth vaping epidemic. In September, this panel heard from federal and state health officials about the skyrocketing use of e-cigarettes throughout the United States. Last year, more than 5 million young people reported using e-cigarettes, up from 3.6 million who reported using them the year before. Just the other day, I met with a group of high school students in Denver at my alma mater, South High School. And while the most recent national survey found that one in four high school students are currently vaping, when I told this to the students, they all shook their heads and said they believe the actual rate is much, much higher. In fact, one sophomore I talked to thinks that more than 60% of his peers are using e-cigarettes. Now, as I've said, before, many times, this teen vape vaping epidemic is personal to me because in my state of Colorado, we have the highest percentage of teens vaping than anywhere. According to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, e-cigarettes pose risk to all users, but most particularly to young people. The vast majority of e-cigarettes contain nicotine, which according to the National Institutes of Health can be as addictive as heroin or cocaine a fact which anecdotally was cemented by the high school students I actually talked to the other day. Nicotine can harm brain development, affect respiratory health, and can lead to heart disease. Further, research shows that youth who use e-cigarettes are more likely to be using combustible cigarettes, a fact also confirmed to me by the high school students. E-cigarette manufacturers have been negligent at best or intentional at worst in attracting young people to their products. Flavor options, concealable designs, highly addictive nicotine levels, and slick marketing campaigns have all been used to lure millions of young people into using e-cigarettes. Parents and public officials have been left scrambling to address this epidemic. And no one, not parents, not public health officials, and not the students who vape, fully understands the health impacts of e-cigarettes. What's worse is many of the young people actually believe that these products are safe or harmless, also confirmed me, to me by the South High Rebels I was talking to. And you know what? This simply is not true. The CDC has stated that all tobacco products, including e-cigarettes, carry health risks. The only reason e-cigarettes are available on the market today is because the Food and Drug Administration gave them a temporary pass by exercising or refusing to exercise its enforcement discretion. No e-cigarette currently being sold in the United States has been reviewed by the FDA for its impact on public health. Instead, the e-cigarette industry has essentially been allowed to conduct a public health experiment in real time without knowing what the consequences of these products may be and our young people are paying the price. So this is why the Congress decided to act. In December, Chairman Pallone, myself, as well as some of my other colleagues today, took an important first step to raise the nationwide minimum age to buy any tobacco product, including e-cigarettes to 21. Clearly, more needs to be done, such as advancing legislation that Chairman Pallone, I, and others have introduced to tackle this public health priority. These efforts are all the more important given that the, recent, the administration recently came to industry influence. Despite the FDA's announcement last September that it intended to ban all non-tobacco flavored e-cigarette products to address the rising youth rate, youth rate, the final policy issued in January includes exemptions and loopholes. Not only are menthol flavored e-cigarettes still allowed under the FDA's new guidelines, so are the fruity and sweet flavored e-liquids and disposable e-cigarette products. These loopholes may lead to young people shifting to using menthol flavored products or disposable e-cigarettes that remain on the market. In fact, there are reports that the shift is already happening. The kids at South told me that it's harder for them to get e-cigarettes at the gas station. Good news. Bad news is people are just going to these vape shops to get these products. 
So while well, companies claim that the e-cigarettes have the potential to help adults who smoke combustible cigarettes, it's important to note that CDC cautions such as a health benefit would only apply if the smoker were able to quit and completely. We know that a majority of adult e-cigarette users, however, are dual users, meaning they both smoke and vape, which could be more dangerous than using either product alone. So now the question is, for every adult smoker who may quit smoking because they're using an e-cigarette, how many young people will start using those e-cigarettes and develop a lifelong nicotine addiction? We must ensure that we're not only attempting to solve one public health problem and by creating another at the expense of young people's health. The responsibility to protect young people from these dangerous products cannot fall solely on parents, teachers, and health officials. And I'm glad you gentlemen are here because the industry caused this mess and the industry needs to be responsible for cleaning it up. Today, we're gonna to hear from the companies responsible for these products. I really do appreciate you coming because I really do want you to be part of the solution. And so, uh, we're gonna have a lot of questions. We're looking forward to this hearing. I know I went a little over time, Mr. Guthrie, which I don't usually do, so I'm happy to give you another minute for your opening statement. And with that, I'm pleased to recognize the uh, ranking member of the, full of the subcommittee, Mr. Guthrie, for five minutes. Six minutes. Six minutes. <laughs> well, thank you, uh, Chair DeGette, and I appreciate uh, the opportunity to be here and appreciate all of our witnesses here this morning. I uh, thank you for holding this important hearing, and I share your concern about youth vaping trends that have emerged in the United States in recent years. The U.S. Surgeon General has called e-cigarette usage by youth an epidemic and warned that it threatens decades of progress towards ensuring that fewer young people use tobacco. The most recent data from the National Youth Tobacco Survey show that 27.5% of use, and of course you said that you think it's higher than that from your, your sample there, um, reported using e-cigarettes compared with 20.8% in 2018. We do know it's more. And the market is, has increased. The marketing of e-cigarette products to children must stop, and youth access to e-cigarette products must be prevented. This will require an all-hands-on-deck approach from all parties, including the federal government, manufacturers, and retail stores. We've already made strides to curb youth access in tobacco since we last held a hearing in September. In December, as mentioned by the chair, Congress passed and, and President Trump signed into law a legislation to raise the legal age to purchase tobacco products, including e-cigarettes from 18 to 21. On January the 2nd, 2020, FDA issued guidance finalizing in its enforcement policy regarding unauthorized flavored cartridge-based e-cigarettes that appeal to children, including fruit and mint. Under this policy, as of February the 6th, 2020, tomorrow, companies must cease manufacturing, distribution, and sale of unauthorized flavored cartridge-based e-cigarettes other than tobacco or menthol or risk FDA enforcement action. This guidance also gives the FDA the ability to pivot its, its enforcement priorities as needed I hope to hear from our witnesses today whether this enforcement guidance will effectively target youth access or if there are other or more effective steps the FDA should take either alone or in conjunction with the industry. Further, according to FDA's new guidelines, manufacturers like the ones before us today must submit pre-market tobacco product applications to FDA by May 12, 2020 for deemed tobacco products, including e-cigarette products, they were on the market as of August the 8th, 2016. Through their applications, manufacturers or importers must demonstrate to the FDA, among other things, that marketing of new tobacco products would be appropriate for the protection of public health. As part of this determination, FDA must consider the risk and benefits of the product to the population as a whole, including users and non-users of tobacco products. If manufacturers do not submit their pre-market applications by May 12th, any products for which an application is not submitted must be pulled from the market. These legal and regulatory developments will drastically change e-cigarette landscape in the coming months and year. While these actions are aimed at reducing the attraction of e-cigarettes to youth and protecting broader public health, wide bans and narrowing of what is legally available in the legitimate marketplace will almost certainly shift product use for existing users to other products that are still available. We must be vigilant in responding to this potential shift in utilization, which may result in an increase of black market or counterfeit demand for e-cigarette products. We must ensure that our efforts to protect our youth and the broader public health 
do not inadvertently create a bigger and more complicated problem. Though not re directly related to today's hearing, I continue to be concerned about the lung injury outbreak associated with vaping and e-cigarette use. These illnesses must be, have been closely associated with black market products and THC or marijuana derivative. While the number of cases appear to have peaked when this subcommittee held its first e-cigarette hearing in September, we have since learned that according to the Center for Disease Control, an illness outbreak was strongly linked to vitamin E acetate, addictive and a, a additive to THC or marijuana e-cigarettes. We need to more clearly understand the cause of these illnesses. It is my understanding that e-cigarette manufacturers have taken, have taken and are continuing to take their own actions to prevent youth, prevent youth access to their products. This hearing can serve as a constructive discussion for us to, us to learn more about what these manufacturers are doing to prevent youth uh, utilization of e-cigarettes. Before I conclude, I would like to make a quick comment and, and recognize the subsidiary of Reynolds that is located in my district, it's Kentucky Bioprocessing. Kentucky Bioprocessing was founded in Owensboro, Kentucky with a group of uh, visionary local entrepreneurs who wanted to find ways to use the tobacco plant that is constructive to public health. And in doing so, they found that it was uh, a host for growing vaccines to the Ebola a population that was used in emergency situations in the previous Ebola outbreak and is now working to address uh, potential uh, vaccines with the coronavirus. I am glad that uh, KBP is working on alternative uses for tobacco in order to better America's public health. I thank our witnesses for being here today and being part of this important discussion, and I yield back. Thank the gentleman. Chair now recognizes the chair of the full committee, Mr. Pallone, for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm pleased we're holding this hearing so we can shed more light on the youth tobacco epidemic and how we got here. The significant progress that was made to curb tobacco use has simply vanished. Last year, 6.2 million middle school and high school students reported using tobacco products, including one in three high school students and one in eight middle school students, and these are shocking and concerning numbers. And today we're here to not only ask how this happened, but what is going to be done to reverse these dangerous new trends in tobacco use? While federal leg regulators share in this blame, a large portion of culpability rests with the manufacturers of e-cigarette products. These manufacturers saw an opportunity to, to hook a new generation on their products and used every trick in the book to make their products appeal to kids through sweet flavors, glossy marketing campaigns, and slick product designs. It's long past time that the Food and Drug Administration move forward with reviewing the health and safety risks of the e-cigarette products that are currently on the market. And then the FDA must act swiftly to remove any products that are not in compliance. But it's also time for the manufacturers, including those before us today, to acknowledge the responsibility they have to ensure young people are protected from a lifetime of nicotine addiction. We do not know all of the long-term health implications of e-cigarette use, but we do know that nicotine harms the developing brain and that young people who use e-cigarettes are more likely to try combustible cigarettes as well. And that's why I'm so disappointed that President Trump chose to side with industry over the nation's public health by permitting flavored products to remain on the market like menthol, disposable e-cigarettes, and open tank systems mixed in vape shops. The president's announcement last month falls far short of the promises he made last year to address the youth tobacco epidemic, and we shouldn't be fooled. A so-called flavor ban that exempts menthol and vape shops is not a flavor ban at all. And that's also why it's critical that we continue to move forward legislatively with a solution since the Trump administration will not. And I look forward to bringing my bill, the Reversing the Youth Tobacco Epidemic Act, to the floor soon. My legislation not only includes a full flavor ban, it also bans certain non-face-to-face -face sales and protects kids from predatory marketing. It's a comprehensive approach to end this epidemic, and I hope that it garners the bipartisan support that it deserves when it comes to the floor. In the meantime, I want to hear more from the manufacturers and what role they believe their companies have played in the creation of this epidemic and what they're doing to correct it. It's chilling to sit and watch as we are seeing history repeat itself. We've been here before as the tobacco industry admitted to misleading millions of users on the safety of tobacco products. And we can't sit idly by as this happens again. 
For that reason, I hope the witnesses today are forthcoming and acknowledge the role they must play in reversing these dangerous and disturbing trends. And I just wanted to say, I, a few years ago, I started going around to some of my middle schools and talking to the students. And I was amazed at how they didn't think that there was any harmful uh, aspect of e-cigarettes, that they didn't contain any nicotine, that they didn't cause any addiction, that they actually were, you know, just, you know, bubble gum or cotton candy, and that was it. Um, it's the misleading marketing, um, in my opinion, that has caused this epidemic and made young people, um, you know, feel that there was absolutely no problem with vaping. And that's why all the gains that we made uh, from trying to uh, discourage tobacco use, cigarettes, uh, putting the warnings, all that's evaporated now because we have this young generation um, that um, until recently just thought there was not a problem. And I'm pleased to see that uh, we have some younger people here in the audience today uh, speaking out against this, not here necessarily, but um, you know, outside and, and getting the public and the media more aware. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank the gentleman. Chair now yields five minutes to the ranking member of the full committee, Mr. Walden. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, and I, I too, Mr. Chairman, I'm glad these young people are here. When I was a student by president in high school, I know it was a long time ago, um, I led the effort before the school board to uh, get smoking out of the bathrooms. It wasn't legal there, but we actually created a smoking area outside, which was revolutionary. Had to have parental permission and all this other stuff, but we got it out of the bathrooms because I hated smoking. I was the only one in my family that didn't smoke. And uh, my, we've come a long way, so stay involved in, in all of this. And Mr. Guthrie, I, I'd be curious too. I'm gonna go over to the coronavirus uh, briefing for the House in a few minutes, so I, I hope we can find out more about the work that's being done with the tobacco plant, because vaccines and getting to them quicker is something that uh, we've all been working toward for a long time. So Chair get thank you for holding this hearing. Electronic cigarettes or e-cigarettes, the lung illnesses associated with vaping, the youth vaping epidemic, these are major health concerns for the United States, and particularly and sadly in my home state of Oregon, which unfortunately is one of the 27 states where there was a confirmed death from an e-cigarette or vaping product use associated lung injury, eValley. Uh, since the subcommittee's hearing in September with federal and state health officials, we have learned more about what causes these tragic lung illnesses. According to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, laboratory data show that vitamin E acetate and additive in some THC containing, vape, uh, containing vaping products is strongly linked to the E-Valley outbreak. While there is still more to learn about the E-Valley and, and what causes it, we must remain vigilant about a separate but equally alarming issue, the troubling statistics regarding e-cigarette use among youth. As Republican Leader Guthrie noted, the most recent data from the National Youth Tobacco Survey is alarming. We all share this concern. 27.5% of youth reported using e-cigarettes in 2019. That compares to 20.8% in 2018. It's a big jump from 11.3% just three years ago. Given these trends, the Trump administration, the state's manufacturers, all of you before us today in this committee are right to look for solutions to curb, stop youth access to e-cigarettes. I applaud the Trump administration's pursuit of a solution to, the, to address our country's youth vaping epidemic. For example, in December, President Trump signed legislation to raise the legal age to purchase tobacco products from 18 to 21. Additionally, the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, FDA, issued guidance in January finalizing its enforcement policy regarding unauthorized flavored cartridge-based e-cigarettes that appeal to children, including fruit and mint. In addition to these two changes, the May deadline for manufacturers to submit the pre-market tobacco product applications, PMTA, to FDA is quickly approaching, which will shift the industry's landscape even further. Now, while these are all promising steps, we remain concerned about the counterfeit and black market products that current e-cigarette users, including our youth, may increasingly turn to when products they are currently using will no longer be available in the, in the legal and legitimate marketplace. I'm also concerned about the potential shifts to youth usage to other non-cartridge-based e-cigarettes, and I'm interested in hearing from the companies today their thoughts on how we can prevent this from occurring. I'd also like to note the irony of the health subcommittee of this uh, full committee holding a hearing just two weeks ago that included bills to deschedule and decriminalize marijuana. 
much of which is smoked, followed by this hearing where my colleagues are now denouncing smoking tobacco in all forms. While I have concerns about the epidemic of youth tobacco usage, I believe that concern should extend to expanded youth access to marijuana and marijuana-related products, especially considering the death in Oregon was likely related to a THC vape pod purchased at a dispensary. Denouncing smoking tobacco in all forms while embracing the descheduling or legalization of marijuana is at best inconsistent when considering long-term health outcomes and the lack of research and data. In addition to the committee's ongoing work, Chair Deget, I, I hope you'll invite the FDA to testify again once the PMTA deadline uh, passes in May. I think we could really benefit excellent. While we heard from the FDA in September, uh, it's critical for all of us to continue to hear from the FDA as the issue evolves and the FDA begins to evaluate manufacturers' PMTAs. We also need a full investigation into counterfeit and black market products that are likely to fill the void of the products that are expected to exit the market, whether from the administration's January guidance or from manufacturers who do not file PMTAs and accordingly remove their products from the market. We want to make sure the FDA stands ready to address these issues as they arise to protect current e-cigarette users, but most importantly, our youth. So I want to thank the companies before us for voluntarily coming here. It's important that we hear from you. And uh, Madam Chair, I appreciate you holding this hearing. And I, I'll have to go over to that coronavirus hearing for the members, but uh, we'll be back and forth, and take, I yield back. Take notes over there, OK? Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I just want to say, I don't think there's anybody on this committee that thinks marijuana should be legalized for people under 21. And here, in, here. Addition, in addition, I think everybody on this committee will agree that we need to continue to do the research on that, too. Yes. There's been woefully inadequate research. And in Fully fact, agree. we're planning to have a, a hearing on that um, sometime Excellent. in the near future. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Chair will now ask unanimous consent that the members' written, written opening statements be made part of the record. With that objection, so ordered. Uh, Chair would also like to, rec rec to welcome Representative Shalala for joining us at the hearing today. Uh, Representative Shalala is not on this committee, and so under Rule 11 of the House of Representatives, members, delegates, and residents can participate in committee hearings. Uh, but but uh, they're not able to question witnesses, but I think we could all stipulate that she probably has more institutional knowledge about health care policy than anybody in this Congress, so we're really happy to have you join us. Uh, I'd now like to introduce our witnesses for today's hearing. Mr. Casey Crosswaite, CEO of Jewel, welcome. Mr. Ricardo Oberlander, who's the President and CEO of Reynolds America, Inc., welcome. Glad to have you. Mr. Ryan Nivakoff, CEO of Enjoy LLC, Mr. Antoine Blonde, who is president of Fontem US, welcome. Mr. Jerry Lofton, who's the president of Logic Technology Development LLC, and welcome to you too, Mr. Lofton. Thank you, thanks to all of our witnesses for appearing today before the subcommittee. You're aware uh, that the committee is holding an investigative hearing and when doing so has the, pr the practice of taking testimony under oath. Does anyone have any objection to testifying under oath today? Let the record reflect that the witnesses have responded no. The chair then advises you that under the rules of the House and the rules of the committee, you're entitled to be accompanied by counsel. Does anyone desire to be accompanied by counsel today? Let the record reflect again that the witnesses have responded no. If you would then, please rise and raise your right hand so that you may be sworn in. You swear the testimony that you are about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? You may be seated. Let the record reflect the witnesses have responded affirmatively, and all of you are now under oath and subject to the penalty set forth in Title 18, Section 1001 of the U.S. Code. The chair will now recognize our witnesses for a five-minute summary of their written statements. In front of each of you, there's a microphone, a timer, and a series of lights. The timer will count down your time, and the red light will turn on when your, your five minutes have come to an end. And so now, Mr. Crossway, I'm delighted to recognize you for five minutes, please.
Mr. Oberlander, see if your microphone works. Hello. Okay, can you pass that over to Mr. Crossley? Thank you. Thank you so much. Chair Deget, Chairman Pallone, Ranking Members Guthrie and Walden, other distinguished subcommittee members, my name is KC Crosswaite and I am CEO of Jewel Labs, a position I assumed when I joined the company about four months ago. At Jewel Labs, our thousands of U.S. employees are committed to helping adult smokers transition away from combustible cigarettes while combating the serious problem of underage use. As we look at the vapor category, it is helpful to begin by noting the significant changes that have taken place in a relatively short period of time. At the start of 2019, most Americans lived in states where the legal age of purchase was just 18. Vapor products were available in a wide array of flavors. There was low awareness of black market vapor products and the deadline for PMTA submissions to the FDA was uncertain. In contrast, today, 21 plus is the law of the land, thanks to many of you on this committee. Under FDA guidance, pod-based products are now available in only tobacco and menthol. Congress, the FDA, and the President have raised the alarm on black market products, and the PMTA deadline of May 2020 is rapidly approaching. At Jewel Labs, we recognize the importance of these steps. Over the past few years, trust in our company and category has eroded. We know some of our past actions have contributed to that erosion, and we are committed to taking concrete action to re-earn that trust. We halted our broadcast, print, and digital product advertising we voluntarily restricted the sale of flavors other than tobacco and menthol. And we restructured our company to focus on developing technologies to combat underage use and to conduct research in support of our PMTA submission. Clearly, we still have a long way to go. Underage use rates remain unacceptably high. But we believe that this challenge can and must be met it threatens the entire harm reduction opportunity represented by vapor products. And that opportunity is too important to lose. Combustible cigarettes remain the leading cause of preventable death in our country and worldwide. More than 34 million Americans still smoke. Each year, nearly half a million Americans die from smoking-related diseases. To be clear, anyone who doesn't use nicotine shouldn't start. Anyone who smokes should quit. For those who can not or will not quit, less harmful alternatives like vapor products should be available. Public health authorities agree that it's not the nicotine, but the burning of tobacco and smoke that causes disease and death. As the FDA noted in 2017, in quote, nicotine, while highly addictive, is delivered through products that represent a continuum of risk and is most harmful when delivered through smoke particles in combustible cigarettes." End quote. At the same time, the FDA stated its intent to encourage innovation that could provide adult smokers a less harmful way to consume nicotine. Juul products are one example of this type of innovation. Our products are not risk-free but research indicates that vapor products are substantially lower risk than cigarettes. Research also indicates that many, if not most, adult smokers who try Juul products are able to successfully transition completely off of cigarettes. We will provide all of this research to the FDA through the PMTA process. That process, which we support, is a science and evidence-based review that will evaluate the harm reduction potential of our products, along with the ability to prevent youth usage. If authorized by the FDA, our products will be marketed under strict oversight, 
subject to the comprehensive regulatory powers invested in the agency by Congress. Chair Deget, Ranking Member Guthrie, my company is working hard to listen to our stakeholders so together we can make progress towards the twin goals of helping more adults switch away from cigarettes while combating underage use. My hope is today's panel can be another step along that path. I thank you for the opportunity. I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you so much. Uh, Chair now recognizes Mr. Oberlander for five minutes for an opening statement. And, and actually, yeah, what, hold off for one minute. We're going to replace Mr. Crossway's microphone so you don't have to keep shifting back and forth all day. Thank you so much, Mr. Oberlander. You're now recognized for five minutes. Hello. Good. Thank you. Sorry for that. Chair Deget, Ranking Member Guthrie, and members of the subcommittee, Chairman Pallone, Ranking Member Walden, and distinguished members. My name is Ricardo Belander. I'm the President and CEO of Rains American Inc. I appreciate this opportunity to share information about our company and to continue this important conversation today. Over a decade ago, Reynolds set a goal to transform the tobacco market through innovative products that could make tobacco harm reduction a reality for adult smokers. Doing so requires us to provide consumer acceptable products that may present less risk, including products in the vaping category. In pursuing this goal, we have focused on both innovation and responsibility, because the two must not be separated. The way we bring innovative products to market and how we market those products are as important as the products themselves. Our marketing is important. It is how we communicate with adult smokers about alternatives to combustible cigarettes. As detailed in our submissions to the committee, we have rigorous standards in place to ensure our marketing is accurate and is responsibly directed to adult smokers 21 and older. We impose numerous restrictions on the content of our marketing and limit with whom we communicate. Our vapor brand is views. Our consumer demographics confirm our focus on adults. 95% of views consumers are over 25 and 70% are over 35. With respect to youth vaping, when Views was a market leader through 2017, youth vaping rates actually declined. And the most recent National Youth Tobacco Survey results show that Views is not popular among youth. Thus, we have demonstrated and continue to demonstrate that it is possible to responsibly market alternative products and manufacture them under rigorous product stewardship standards. The increase in youth vaping over the past two years and serious health issues from illicit products are now at the heart of a national discussion. These issues are being discussed within families, by educators, and in state and local governments. They are being discussed in law enforcement communities, the White House, and here today in the United States Congress. 
We support action by the administration and Congress to address both issues. It is important to public health and to adult consumers. Looking forward, FDA's pre-market tobacco application process provides a pathway for vapor products aligned with public health priorities. We believe vapor products can be manufactured and marketed responsibly within this framework. In fact, we have already made extensive EMTA submissions for our views products. There are additional actions we encourage you to consider. First, transparency in the PMTA process is critical. We suggest FDA disclose which products have been submitted for PMTA approval. This will help retailers and the public know which vapor products are undergoing PMTA review and are eligible to remain on the market and will help FDA and state officials enforce the law. Second, FDA needs to adopt regulations that expedite important innovations. For example, we are exploring technologies that could provide additional measures for reducing potential youth usage. However, the current PMTA process, although thorough and welcome, would significantly delay, delay bringing this type of responsible innovation to market. Third, FDA should consider adopting additional and rotating warnings for vapor products. These warnings could reinforce that vaping products are not safe and not for youth. We already include many such statements in our packaging and brand website. And finally, FDA has a track record of success with its youth prevention program. We applaud the agency's success and encourage it to be continued and expanded. In conclusion, we believe a level setting of the vapor market through the PMJ process we will help address the serious issues facing us today. At the same time, it will foster continued transformation of the tobacco category and significantly benefit public health. I thank the committee for the opportunity to share Reyna's views about these important issues and reiterate our full commitment to cooperating with this committee and FDA. Thank you so much. Uh, Mr. Nevikoff, now you are recognized for five minutes, please. Good morning, Chair DeGette, Chairman Pallone, Ranking Member Guthrie, Ranking Member Walden, and distinguished members of the subcommittee. My name is Ryan Nivikoff, and I'm the CEO of Enjoy. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today to discuss with you the important public health dynamics associated with electronic cigarettes. I am humbled to be here today to provide Enjoy's insights into this complex and vitally important conversation. By way of background, I joined Enjoy for deeply personal reasons. As I am sure is the case with many of the people in this room, my family has been victimized by one of the most deadly articles of commerce ever created, the combustible cigarette. As a boy, I watched as my grandmother perished well before her time, and as my once virile grandfather, a veteran of the Army and Marine Corps, and a police officer for over 38 years, spent the last six years of his life attached feebly to an oxygen tank, unable to even sit up without losing his breath. It is with these horrifying memories in mind that I joined Enjoy and wrote our mission statement to make smoking history by helping adults find an alternative to combustible cigarettes. From day one, it was clear to me that neither we at Enjoy nor other pioneers in harm reduction would be able to advance that mission if the public health benefits of electronic cigarettes were overshadowed by a surge of youth use. To that end, Enjoy has pursued its mission with the goal of ensuring that our products do not fall into the hands of America's youth. Though hollow as it may sound, this industry has the greatest incentive, both moral and economic, to ensure that youth use is eliminated. If that goal is not accomplished, this life-changing technology may rightfully and ironically be relegated to the ashtray of history. We see today's hearing as an opportunity for productive dialogue to move forward together collectively to protect the public health. There are approximately 34 million Americans who still smoke combustible cigarettes and over a billion people worldwide. Those smokers face a greater than 50% chance of premature death, death if they continue to smoke. And each year, nearly 500,000 Americans die prematurely from smoking-related disease. Switching adult smokers from combustible cigarettes to electronic cigarettes has the potential to save millions of lives and trillions of dollars in preventable health care expenses. These assertions are not mere industry taglines designed to obfuscate otherwise nefarious or profit-driven motives. Former FDA Commissioner Scott Gottlieb has stated, if you can fully switch every currently addicted adult smoker who is using combustible tobacco products onto e-cigarettes, you will have a profound impact on public health. 
With this in mind, Enjoy has recognized from inception that, contrary to popular opinion, addicting a new generation of nicotine users would not further our moral or financial bottom lines, but rather be our undoing. We've built our business in accordance with that ethos, and the data prove that it is working. According to the National Youth Tobacco Survey, in 2019, only 1.2% of high school students who used electronic cigarettes within the prior 30 days reported using Enjoy products. Indeed, in the most recent National Youth Tobacco Survey, Enjoy's use rate for high schoolers, despite being one of the top three national brands, is over nine times lower than the combined use of two brands that were not even part of the survey, but were written in by students who used those brands. Further, the FDA's yearly retail inspection violation data consistently shows that Enjoy's products are involved in the fewest violations of the top four e-cigarette brands. For example, in the fiscal year beginning October 2017, FDA recorded more than 3,300 violations, including electronic cigarettes, of which only 20 involved Enjoy products, which is less than 1%. The following fiscal year, FDA recorded over 5,250 violations, only 28 of which involved Enjoy products, barely one half of 1%. And in the present fiscal year, Enjoy products were involved in only eight violations of the 839 recorded by FDA thus far, again, less than 1%. While Enjoy will strive to continue to reduce this number even farther, Enjoy is proud of its track record of success thus far. To be clear, however, my goal is not to aggrandize Enjoy's track record, nor to draw comparisons against my competition. Rather, I provide this data merely to demonstrate that with proper regulation and vigilant self-policing, there is a path forward for this life-changing technology, a path that can provide an off-ramp for adults without creating an on-ramp for youth. And I'm confident that everyone on this panel shares that very same dedication to eliminating underage vaping. I welcome the opportunity to share with the subcommittee more detail about the policies and procedures by which Enjoy has been able to serve its, its mission to adult smokers while minimizing access to youth. I look forward to answering your questions and thank you again for the opportunity to be here. Thank you so much. I now uh, recognize Mr. Blonde for five minutes for an opening statement. Chair De Gett, Chairman Pallone, Ranking Member Guthrie, members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to appear today before the House Committee of Energy and Commerce, Oversight and Investigation Subcommittee to discuss the important issues regarding electronic nicotine delivery system, ENDS, commonly referred as e-cigarettes. My name is Antoine Blondet, and I am president of Fontem US, Incorporated. Fontem US markets and sells the blue brand, uh, which we acquired from another company in uh, June 2015. As you are aware, Fontem has cooperated extensively with the committee's investigation since it began last August and provided several hundred of pages of material in response to the committee's request for information. We believe the facts make clear that Fontem is a responsible actor in the e-cigarette marketplace and we are committed to ensuring to our business that our business practices are consistent with our objective of providing adult consumers only with the highest quality products and an enjoyable product experience. I would like to briefly address four points. First, Fontaine believes without equivocation that youth should not use any e-cigarette product. We share the subcommittee's view that preventing youth access to e-cigarette is an issue of critical importance. In this regard, Fontem does not and has never directed its marketing efforts for e-cigarette youth. Second, Fontem takes extensive steps to ensure that its e-cigarette stealth channel reflects Fontem's commitment to youth access prevention. Fontem's e-cigarettes are sold through three main distribution channels. The traditional brick and mortar, which are the convenience stores, the gas station, e-commerce and vape shops. In each distribution channel, Fontem takes steps to ensure that youth do not have access to blue product. Third, Fontem has invested extensively in its product stewardship program. Fontem is also committed to responsibly product stewardship practices and ensuring product quality is thoughtfully integrated from product conception to consumer use. Fourth, Fontem's products have not been found by the U.S. Center of Disease Control to be involved in any of the incidents of respiratory illness it has investigated. We were deeply concerned by reports last year leaking 
uh, respiratory illnesses to the use of vaping product. And we joined calls for the CDC to investigate these instances as soon as possible. Vitamin E acetate is not and has never been an ingredient in blue product. And we are not aware of any Fontaine product being referenced by the CDC as involved in incidences it has investigated. Further, we fully agree with the CDC's advice that consumers should not buy any vaping product, especially the one containing THC, from unknown sources or in black market. Of course, we will continue to monitor these uh, developments very closely. These initiatives are some examples of Fontem's extensive efforts in the areas of youth access prevention and product quality. All of us at Fontem are dedicated to ensuring that our products are of the highest quality and that they are marketed and sold only to adult consumers. I thank you for your time and attention to these important issues. Uh, on behalf of Fontem US, we look for, forward to working with the Congress and FDA and continue doing so, and I'm happy to answer any question you will have. Thank you, Mr. Blondet, and I apologize for mispronouncing your name earlier. Mr. Lofton, you are now recognized for five minutes for an opening statement. Chairman DeGette, Ranking Member Guthrie, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for inviting me to testify at this hearing. I'm Jay Lofton, President of Logic, and I appreciate the opportunity to contribute to this very important inquiry. To my knowledge, only one company has all of its ends pre-market tobacco applications accepted for substantive review by the FDA. That's Logic. Logic has consistently acted responsibly. Since we started, Logic has had numerous measures to deter youth access to ends. We share your concerns regarding unlawful products and those that intentionally target minors or are marketed as low risk or cessation products without approval. So as much as I am grateful for the opportunity to participate today and discuss the numerous challenges we face, I do not wish to be painted with the same brush as others because we operate differently. We've made every effort to responsibly market our products with controls in place aimed at preventing youth appeal and access. We did this not because it was mandated by law at the time or because we were facing lawsuits or because we generated bad publicity with our products or marketing. We did this because it's the right thing to do. We don't suggest that our products are cessation devices. We have not and do not use influencers to convince children or adults to try our products. We're not evangelists claiming to offer a cure for smoking. Other companies have caused tremendous damage to the reputation of this category while putting America's youth in harm's way. Logic has always and will always responsibly market and sell its products to adults only, period. From our first day, Logic's product packaging and website have carried a warning clearly stating that our products contain nicotine, which is addictive. Our products are for adults only, and underage sale is prohibited. Purchases through our website have always been restricted to age-verified adults, and even before the deeming regulations took effect, we further restricted sales to those age 21 and above. Perhaps others now have some of these practices in place, but introducing these when you must rather than because it's the right thing to do, is different altogether. Logic isn't a brand that resonates with youth. Our online data shows that Logic's typical consumer looks much more like me than my adult children. This is not by chance. It's the result of the responsible steps that Logic has taken, such as only using people who are over the age of 30 in our consumer marketing materials. Was it difficult to stand by and watch others take a less responsible approach and see our competitors' business soar? Yes, it was. Their growth came at great cost. It has tarnished the entire category, caused a serious youth uptake problem, and created doubt and fear in this country. Rather than treated counterfeits products as an excuse for the problems at hand, Logic has committed substantial resources towards eliminating them. For nearly four years, We've worked with the FDA, Homeland Security, CBP, and law enforcement to stop thousands of Ill illegitimate sales of our products online and at retail. We vocally and consistently called for the FDA to close the window 
that it opened when it pushed the PMTA deadlines back and for the FDA to immediately and robustly impose and enforce pre-market regulatory requirements. The FDA has the authority to rid the market of products that are not appropriate for the protection of public health and to determine based on science and evidence, including the likely impact on the population as a whole, whether a product should remain on the market irrespective of design, irrespective of flavor. Yes, Logic has flavored products. That's because many adults prefer them to the taste of menthol. The simple existence of flavors doesn't cause a youth problem. What does is irresponsible marketing combined with products that are designed and marketed to appeal to youth. That's why we don't agree with wholesale bans on flavors. That's why we believe in allowing the FDA to decide which products should be on the market through the PMT process. Having never manufactured or marketed our products to appeal to young people, having acted with responsibility and integrity, I and everyone at Logic will do what we can to support the committee with this ongoing work. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Mr. Lofton. It's now time for the committee to ask questions and the chair will recognize herself for five minutes. People are confused when it comes to the health and safety of e-cigarettes, and I heard this the other day over at South High School. Uh, the U.S. Surgeon General has noted that young people try e-cigarettes assuming that either they're less harmful than other tobacco products or even that they're not harmful at all. So I want to clear a couple of things up with this panel. These questions should be able to be answered with a simple yes or no answer. So my first question is, isn't it true that nicotine is addictive? Mr. Crossway? Yes, nicotine is addictive. Mr. Oberlander? Nicotine is addictive. Mr. Nivikoff? Yes. Mr. Blonde? Yes. Mr. Lofton? Yes. And um, isn't it true then that using the products each of your companies makes, which contain, contain nicotine, could lead to nicotine addiction? Mr. Crossway? Yes, nicotine is addictive. And your products could lead to nicotine addiction, correct? Yes, it could. Mr. Oberlander? Any product containing nicotine is addictive. And your products that, that people use containing nicotine could Pain. cause people to become addicted, yes? Yes, they do. Mr. Nivikoff? Yes, ma'am. Mr. Blonde? Yes. Mr. Lofton? Yes. And um, nicotine, can, um, do you agree with the medical studies that show that, neg that nicotine can have neg negative consequences for respiratory health and can cause an increase in blood pressure, heart rate, and lead to heart disease, and also could harm brain development in young people, Mr. Crossway? As part of our PMTA, we will have all of our studies submitted to be reviewed. So, so have you seen the studies that show that, that there are these issues that I just mentioned? I'm not familiar with the one you're. You don't know. To. So, do you do do you maintain that nicotine causes no health consequences in people? Then, no. Nicotine is addictive. And, and does it have health consequences? It can cause harm. Yes, but Mr. Oberlander, uh -huh. did you hear my uh, question about the studies? What's your view? Yes, I did. Our scientific team actually monitors all the literature regarding. So, nicotine. so, so, would you agree that nicotine could cause? respiratory health issues, blood pressure, heart rate, and brain development issues? As I said before, nicotine is addictive and tobacco products can cause harm. Could they cause the harms I just talked about? I'm not familiar with this. You don't know. Mr. Nivikoff, what about you? I'm not in a position to corroborate nor so repeat. So you don't know, story. you don't know if it could cause those harms? Nicotine can cause health issues. I'm, I'm what health a, issues do you I'm think? I'm just not in a position to corroborate. Okay, what, what health issues do you think they could cause? Um, I, nicotine can raise your blood pressure. It can, okay. It can, it can cause headaches. Mm -hmm. Okay. But you don't really know about any other things. I'm not aware of the studies. No, you're, you're the CEO of the company. Okay. Mr. Blonde? Uh, nicotine is addictive and as such can cause harm. Okay. The harm, it, it, I find it fascinating. No one really wants to talk about what that harm is. The medical studies show that it can cause respiratory health problems, blood pressure, heart rate problems, and brain development problems in young people. Do you think it caused any of those harms? I have no reason to doubt those studies, but I'm not Thank aware you. of them. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Lofton? 
Nicotine is addictive, and we put all the warning labels onto our product. I understand that. Do you think it could cause the harms that I'm talking about? We're going to leave that up to the FDA to decide through the PMTA process, the specifics. So you're not going to commit to that either. See, when you say nicotine is addictive, I don't think that a lot of young people understand what that means in terms of health consequences. Mr. Nivikoff, I was really moved by what you said about your, I think your grandmother and your grandfather. My mother died of lung cancer at age 54 from smoking, which she started doing when she was under 21. And I, I'm sure she knew it was addictive, but I don't think she had any idea. And I think people think that e-cigarettes, sure they're addictive, but they're not gonna cause the same harm as cigarettes. In fact, we don't really know. Now, I want to um, ask you another yes or no question. Maybe you'll answer it. Do you agree with the CDC that there's no completely safe tobacco product, including e-cigarettes, Mr. Crossway? Yes, our products are not without Mr. Risk. Oberlander? No tobacco product is safe. Including your e-cigarettes? Including them. Mr. Nivikoff? Yes, ma'am, I agree. Mr. Blonde? I agree. And Mr. Lofton? All tobacco products carry risk. Okay, one last question. Do you all agree that there's a youth vaping epidemic in this country and that people under 21 should not be using e-cigarettes, including your products, Mr. Crossway? I completely agree. Mr. Oberlander? So that gets one. Mr. Mr. Nivikoff? Yes, ma'am, I agree. Mr. Blonde? Absolutely. Mr. Lofton? I agree. What did you want to say? One youth vaping is too many. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate uh, all of you. And now I recognize Mr. Guthrie for five minutes. Good to see you all here. Uh, thank you for being here. And uh, I want to um, begin by asking, actually, I want to begin by look, understanding the FDA's authorities. So concerns have been raised about disposable products still being on the market and therefore potentially available to youth, included newer flavor products such as Puff Bars or Posh. And this is directed to Mr. Blonde and Mr. Nivikov. Um, I want to make sure we all understand FDA's authorities. Is it correct that under the F the deeming rule, FDA can currently remove products that enter the market after August the 8th, 2016? Yes, sir, that's correct. That's correct. That is correct. In fact, the FDA has used the authority removing nearly 100 flavored products by Eon Smoke from the market in October of 2019. So to um, Mr. Blonde and Mr. Nivikoff, under the January enforcement guidance, what actions can FDA take against manufacturers of non-cartridge-based products such as disposable products if the, if, the, if the FDA finds the manufacturers fail to keep them away from minors. Who would you like to go first, sir? Uh, you can go first, yeah. Um, I think what's, what's sometimes lost in, in the FDA guidance is that there were three prongs of the FDA's guidance document that allowed FDA to take action against products, um, products that included flavors and products that um, are targeted towards minors or are manufactured or marketed in a way that make them attractive to youth. So. Uh, the products that you refer to, while I can't comment on their genesis, I can say that to the extent that they create an increased level of youth use, FDA has the sweeping authority to remove them from the market summarily. So uh, since you've you answered that, I'll, and I'll ask Mr. Blonde to answer this second, you first and the second. And so what is your company? Because you have disposable products for the others. So what, what have you done to prevent disposable products from being in available to youth? Um, well... Historically, our disposable products have not contributed to really any statistically meaningful level of youth use. Um, our historical practices to avoid youth use across the spectrum of our products have been um, avoiding, in, 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 in our case, eliminating all advertising activity that, that occurs outside of the confines of the, ph the physical premises of a licensed tobacco retailer. Uh, we've eliminated a social media presence. And then specifically with respect to um, I think the inference regarding flavored disposables, a week ago we made the decision to voluntarily remove our flavored products, uh, our flavored disposable products um, from stores, albeit not because those products have created increased access to youth use. We did so because we felt it was consistent with the spirit of the FDA guidance that the large businesses um, use the PMTA process to adjudicate whether or not flavors are appropriate for the protection of public health. Okay, Mr. Blonde, I have another question to get to, so I want to... Just what your, your companies to keep disposable products out of the hands of youth. What is your company doing? Uh, as, as for all of our products, uh, we keep all of our products outside of the hand of youth. We're a very robust youth access prevention program. Um, and, and this is through our 
um, marketing practices, all over it, uh, the use of um, all, the, all the means that we put in, in marketing are only dedicated to adult consumers and we are being uh, very careful about that. Uh, we are using uh, very strict labeling rules as well to make sure that our products are informative and appropriate for consumption for adult smokers only. Uh, and we engage very actively we are with our retailers, uh, partners, to make sure that uh, not any product is being sold to, uh, to a youth. Uh, Thank you. And so the other three, since y'all answered, I, would, I was just wanted to get to what actions has your company, recent actions has your company taken to curb youth access to the products? And do you monitor uh, access and, and how do you make sure youth aren't using them? And then I think Mr. Lofton used the term, he, they have controls in place. So if you want to talk about what controls in place each of you, the other two kind of answer that question to keep youth from having access to your product. Thank you. When I joined the organization, it was obvious to me that youth use levels were unacceptable. And we took immediate action when I joined and we uh, pulled back and stopped all of our product, our digital and broadcast uh, print advertising. When I saw uh, the access that youth were getting uh, to certain flavors, including of ours, we stopped shipping mint in November of last year. We are also focused at preventing access in the retail channel and working on technology solutions with retailers to ensure that identifications are scanned and bulk limit purchases are in place so that transactions are only happening with adults in retail stores. It's, it's an effort that we are focused on and we know we must combat the underage access to e-vapor. Yeah, can I jump to Mr. Oberlander and then we'll get to Mr. Lofton hopefully before. First of all, our communication has been directed to adult consumers 21 plus since the very beginning. Second, most of our engagement is one-to-one -one permission based. Third, we are early supporters of tobacco 21 plus. Fourth, we have age-gated protocols and process for all our online interactions. Fourth, we have state-of-the-art stage gating for online purchases. Fifth, we have enhanced our contractual po policies and penalties. Okay, I'm out, of, I'm out of time, but, but I have to indulge to the chair, Mr. Lofton. You said you have controls in place, so you're going to give me a few seconds. Yes, sir. We always have a health warning. Online, we have strict age verification. We have no marketing flavors that we specifically go after minors. Consumer marketing, all our models are above 30 years old, and we use no social influencers. Thank you very much. I uh, yield back. Chair now recognizes the chairman of the full committee for five minutes, Mr. Pallone. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanted to say a little disclaimer here. I heard all of you over and over again say you were responsible men, men of integrity. That is not true. Uh, people who are, have integrity and responsible don't sell products which after listening to Ms. Degett's questions, you admit uh, make people sick, probably kill people. Um, if you wanted to be men of integrity and responsible men, uh, you would not be selling this product. You'd do something else. So I just want you to understand, I, I'm very upset by hearing this constant reference to your integrity and responsibility. It's just false. But I wanted to get to the bottom of this. I don't believe for one minute that any of you did not purposely target young people, um, but you're not going to admit that. So let me get to my questions. I continue to be alarmed by the rapid increase in the number of young people who are using your product. Youth interest and curiosity in e-cigarettes stems not only from availability and kid-friendly flavors, but also from the persuasive and targeted marketing tactics. And these tactics are not dissimilar to those used by Big Tobacco decades ago. Instead of Joe Camel, e-cigarette companies have used social media to convince consumers these products will make you cool. A Stanford study found that in the years following the launch of its product, Jules Advertising was, and I quote, widely distributed on social media channels, frequented by youth, was amplified by hashtag extensions, and catalyzed by compensated influencers and affiliates. So my questions are all of you, Mr. Crossway. I could ask the others, but I don't have enough time. Mr. Crossway, at the time that Jules used these tactics, were any controls in place to prevent the advertising and marketing activities from reaching young people? Briefly, if you could answer. Were there any controls or any effort uh, to prevent the advertising and marketing from reaching young people? So just to be clear, we do not do any of the social media uh, programs today. They're not in place. No, I'm talking about when you started doing it. Yeah, so from my uh, recollection, looking back in time, this company never had any intention to uh, market to youth. I know you're gonna say you had no intention. I don't think anybody here is gonna admit their intent was to market to youth. 
But what I'm asking you, at the time that you were doing this, were there any controls in place to prevent the advertising and marketing activities from reaching young people? If the answer is no, you could say no. It was before my time at the company. Okay, it was before we your time. Jewel has acknowledged that it was not able to prevent young people from engaging with its product on social media, so I'm not going to ask you that. But in the November 2018 release announcing your action plan to address underage use of e-cigarettes, Jewel stated, and I quoted, user-generated social media posts involving Jewel products or our brand are proliferating across platforms and must be swiftly addressed, unquote. So, Mr. Crothwaite, what was the tipping point that led Jewel to decide that its marketing practice were a problem that needed to be addressed? I know you're going to say you didn't target uh, uh, young people, but your action plan state that at some point you realized that the social media was causing that. So what was the tipping point that led Jewel to decide that this marketing practices were a problem that you should address? At what point? Well, the company in the past has taken actions uh, when youth data became available, and I believe it was in my best recollection, 2018, the company stopped uh, being okay. on social media. Now, you have disabled Facebook and Instagram accounts, but hashtags involving your products continue to be shared across these social platforms. Despite your efforts to end your social media presence, it's clear that your influence continues to be active through user-generated content. As you indicated, and again in this action plan, and I quote, there is no question that this user-generated social media content is linked to the appeal of vaping to underage users. So, Mr. Crothwaite, after years of marketing practices to attract young people, is it reasonable to say that Jules' actions were too little too late? I mean, hasn't the train already left the station because now, you know, the, under, the, the social media is being used by the people themselves, not by yours? So don't you, don't you think that taking this off the market or all social media was a little, little too late? Chairman yes Cole, or no? When I joined the organization, I knew more needed to be done, and that's why I took the steps that I took to combat this issue that we're facing. Okay, last question, because I only got a few minutes. Do you agree that kids who cannot legally purchase tobacco products should never be the target of tobacco product advertising, including e-cigarette advertising and marketing? Yes or no? No, the product should never be um, intended to be marketed to youth, and that is not the company's intention. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Chair now recognizes Mr. McKinley for five minutes. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, let me, I want to go back to the, uh, um, the numbers of studies that were done by the National Academy of Science, uh, Medicine, uh, and Engineering. And... As a result of all those studies, they made, they've come to a conclusion that said that included in the vaping products are heavy metals, ultrafine particles, and toxic and carcinogen materials, ingredients. I'm going to, do any of you deny that there are Ultrafine particles, let's just focus on the ultrafine particles, the particles in the fluids. Do any of you deny that these particles are there despite the reports? Mr. Crossway? I'm not familiar with the specific report that you were. Sorry. I'm not familiar with the specific report you're referring to, but I will tell you for our no, that's just It's just a conclusion. Do you, really, specifically to your product, do you have ultrafine particles in your product? Yeah, I'm not familiar with the ultrafine uh, particles that... Uh, ultrafine particles are to. defined as one micron. One micron of materials. It was, in a hearing earlier, they indicated that one micron exists in almost all, if not all, and, and maybe even larger. But the concern for young people, and or maybe for anyone, is one micron. Getting in someone's lungs can have some long-term, very deleterious effect. And if we're allowing one micron to be in these fluids, it's going to be introduced to people's lungs. And young people, OP, anyone that uses this product is going to have a health risk, health problem with it. And they're saying that. So you don't know, any of the rest of you acknowledge that, yeah, maybe it's in there? Congressman. Mr. Oberlin? Uh, if I can. I understand your concerns, sir. I, I, use your oh, mic, please. Sorry. sorry. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay, sorry. Uh, I understand your concerns, sir. 
what we do believe is actually through the PMT applications, we can actually provide the FDA with all the evidence in order to understand what's the level of exposure of chemicals like you have mentioned in other, in other substances in order to, uh, for the FDA to make a decision about the impact on public health. Okay, I'm not, apparently I'm not gonna get it, quite the answer I'm looking for, uh, or just an answer. Just for people to understand, one micron, the size of a micron, most people wouldn't understand that, but it, a 50 microns, 50 microns, are visible to the naked eye. We're talking about one fiftieth of a micron is going to be in your lungs. We're going to be introducing it. It's it's a millionth of a meter. We're, we're talking about something extremely small, and at one micron getting into your lungs, you're going to have some long-term problems. We have a, when we've been debating the Clean Air Act and and issues on that, we allow up to two and a half. That's that's the limit we think it that we can tolerate two and a half, but we're allowing this product to be down to one micron, significantly causing long-term healthcare risks. And so my, my, I guess my concern is, um, we're, not only are we allowing these small microns to get into our lungs, but we're also allowing people to introduce other cancerous materials, uh, the the uh, with this in THC, the acetate. Is is that something that we should be paying more attention to? How to prevent people from aftermarket introducing a product into their device, and how do we make it so that it's it's not tamper resistant, but tamper proof, so that people can't play with this and cause even more health concerns. CDC has come out with quite a study about all of this, the THC additive uh, that we were talking about, the vitamin E acetate, how that's being put into aftermarket utilization. Are any of you doing anything to prevent the aftermarket introduction of THC and this vitamin C acetate? Any of you? When Congressman. Sorry. No, Congressman. Made a lot, Lofton, please. Yes, Congressman. We have pre-filled -se pre sealed cartridges that they can't get in at this point. Okay, so we got one of you that's got a preventive medicine, preventive. I've run out of time, I yield back, thank you. Thank the gentleman. Chair now recognizes Ms. Schakowsky for five minutes. So last September, the, uh, last September President Trump promised to take uh, action to take all of the non-tobacco flavored products from the, the, the marketplace in response to the youth vaping epidemic. But he didn't, that's not true. Incredibly, the Trump administration caved to special interests and created exemptions for, um, um, for uh, disposable e-cigarettes in every imaginable flavor and menthol-flavored e-cigarettes. So, Mr. Blonde, um, this carve-out will allow, is my understanding, that uh, Fontem, um, Vivid, Vivid Vanilla and Cherry Blast, to uh, these are disposable products, clearly not aimed at adults to remain on the market. We'll get back to that later. We um, already have reports of, youth, of, uh, of young people shifting to these fruit and dessert flavored disposable products. There's a headline in the uh, New York Times last week that says, teens find a big loophole in the new flavored vaping ban. So you, so you all say your products were created to help adults to stop smoking tobacco. Um, but thanks to your products, this is an entire generation of young people that are now addicted to nicotine. And we've heard discussion about what that problem can be. And the microns, and I thank um, Mr. McKinley for that. Um, Mr. Uh, Crossweight, um, Jewel cannot deny the, uh, the role of its legacy in the epidemic. Um, Jewel um, is, lit is literally 
a common verb now, jeweling, is now what people are talking about. And each of you must accept responsibility for the role that you have played in reviving the youth tobacco epidemic. So, uh, Mr. Uh, or youth vaping epidemic, um, Mr. Lofkin, yes or no? Do you believe the administration's example for any um, uh, exemption, rather, for any disposable product will leave mini uh, um, uh, mint? fruity, and other sweet e-cigarette products easily accessible to young people. We were disappointed in the guidance. We thought it should have gone further, and all companies and all products should have been a part of the PMTA process. Um, Mr. Nivikov, uh, Enjoy uh, recently decided to voluntarily stop selling all flavored disposable products um, and um, that they're not available um, to youth. Do you believe there is a risk that they will s simply turn to using disposable, pro the disposable flavored products? As, as the data has demonstrated, Enjoy hasn't contributed statistically to youth use historically, so the notion that youth would switch from our flavored disposable product to another flavored disposable product is, is factually inaccurate because they haven't been using it to begin with. So disposable e-cigarettes are attractive to youth because they cost less, can be easily hidden, and have an enticing range of flavors. Mr. Blonde? Um, given what you've uh, heard here today, will you join Enjoy and commit to voluntarily suspending um, the sales of your disposable vivid vanilla and cherry uh, and cherry crush uh, products? Uh, um, our disposable products have been in the market for uh, about ten years. And uh, as for other, other disposable product, is uh, widely adopted by um, fairly older consumers. Uh, we are not aware of any issue, current issue, um, caused by our disposable uh, flavored. And um, the fact that the FDA uh, excluded the disposables from the guidance that we will comply on completely, but on disposables, we do have 9 million vapors in the US, more or less adult smokers. Uh, that are currently uh, using our products, which look like a cigarette. It has been designed like that and didn't change over design in the last 10 years. Um, I am aware- And you're not concerned that those are also used by kids, that they may be attracted by those names? We, we don't have any, any issue. We've no, you... had any issue right now on, on historical, and we are monitoring that very carefully. Um, I have a concern, though. I've seen the New York Times articles recently about uh, new disposables coming into the market that probably don't have a youth access prevention program that would be robust enough and as well apparently um, represent some form factors that would be very appealing. Uh, yeah, uh, I'm, uh, my, my, my time has expired. I hear a lot of you relying on the Food and Drug Administration and it seems to me that as much as we want to have the data that you ought to know. I was just shocked that you did not know um, that, uh, about the reports about the content of your vaping products. And I will, uh, I will yield back. Thank the gentlelady. Chair now recognizes Mr. Duncan for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you all for being here today. You know, e-cigarette products have been in use at least since the early 2000s, I believe. And <clears throat> I know we can all agree that the youth vaping epidemic is a serious problem. But if you look at this has been a recent development, so you have to stop and ask yourself, if the products have been out there for that long, you have to ask yourself, why is this a recent occurrence? I say recent, within the last few years. Um, E-cigarettes were developed as an alternative to tobacco products. Tobacco products, which can contain tar and other things that are damaging to the uh, body. But you also have to ask yourself if e-products are used, e-cigarette products are used in Europe and other places in the world, why they aren't seeing the uptick in health-related problems uh, that we're seeing and the deaths that we're seeing here in the United States. These are rhetorical questions that we have to ask ourselves. And I want to reference, Madam Chair, a political article dated October of uh, 2019 and uh, submit it for the record. Without objection. 
In that article, it also references that the Trump administration is urging people to avoid buying unregulated vape products. And I think we can point to the unregulated vape products, uh, the black market products, and the tampered with products as the leading cause for the, the health problems. But they're not seeing that in Europe. In fact, um, Constantine Vardavis, a European Respiratory Society Scientific Regulations Director within the EU, says this, we have not seen anything like what we're seeing in the U.S. recently in Europe, to my knowledge as a scientist, and I'm pretty aware of the field. Clive Bates, former chief of the U.K. Charity Action on Smoking and Health, said this, you're terrifying people who are benefiting from vaping by not smoking. I think that was the ultimate reason the e-cigarette products were created in the first place. So the question I have is, are youth being pushed to black market where they're finding THC pods and other counterfeit products? The lung illnesses that have been reported over the last several months are almost directly linked to the black market products, not the commercially produced products by the companies represented here today. So I think it's extremely important that we have an ongoing conversation about how your companies are working to minimize the number of black market products and what we in Congress can do Instead of attacking you for developing an alternative cigarette use, we ought to talk about how we can work together to help this industry because it is an alternative to smoking. I personally believe that much more could be done to assist the Customs and Border Protection with identifying and Immigration and Customs Enforcement, which seems to get the ire of the left, but they're Customs Enforcement officers that are actually enforcing our customs laws, okay? We need to help, identify, help them to identify and intercept black market e-cigarettes. So my first question for all the witnesses is, can you speak to the relationships your companies have with CBP agents and how you're working alongside them to combat the influx of black market e-cigarettes? And I'll start uh, with Mr. Constant. Thank you, and first, our, our hearts go out to anyone who was hurt and impacted by the unfortunate Ivali situation and we were fully supportive when that investigation was going on, and we do not sell any THC uh, products or products that contain vitamin E. But you're right to call out the amount of illicit products that exist in the United States market. Is it difficult for the CBP officers to detect a counterfeit product versus a legitimate product if it's manufactured overseas? Yeah, so we have a, a brand protection organization within our company who works uh, with law enforcement, border patrol, other uh, regulatory agencies on education, awareness, and helping combat this issue. Mr. Oberlander. First of all, put your mic on, please. Uh, Mr. Congressman, first of all, this is a very serious issue, and I understand your concern. Uh, when the Valley crisis broke out, and we were very concerned about, uh, I mean, very sorry for the pain, actually, the families, the victims, actually, were going through, and we immediately contacted the FDA and the CDC offering our help. Uh, we had, to my knowledge, no confirmed cases associated with our views products, I mean, uh, uh, that are associated with the victims of the Valley crisis. Uh, can you move the microphone back up again, started. Mr. It's okay. Uh, I'm not used to And in this, it's a time I'm running out here. Um, and, and then definitely we have worked with enforcement agencies in order to curb illicit trade, which is a serious problem for this country. Yeah. I'm out of time, guys. Um, let me just reiterate. We need to work with Customs and Border Patrol, Immigration Customs Enforcement uh, agencies. And this committee needs to work with them as well, even though we don't have necessarily jurisdiction to figure out how we can stop the counterfeit products from coming into this country and address the real problem, and that is tampering with the legitimate products and the counterfeit products that people are using in this country, because apparently it's not a problem in Europe. With that, I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Chair now recognizes Mr. Kennedy for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair, for holding this hearing. Thank you for our witnesses for being here. Um, <clears throat> We've heard consistent testimony from, from all of you this morning um, saying these, mar these products were designed to help people transition off of cigarettes, that they were not designed to market to children um, or youth, and that if you're not a smoker, you should not start. Um, I'm going to echo some of the, the skepticism from my colleagues. Some of these products are marketed for 99 cents. It seems pretty easy to get started. I had a youth council from high school students from my district um, over the course of the past several years, it was probably about four years ago, where a high school student asked me if Congress was gonna step in and regulate e-cigarettes because everyone in their school was smoking. 
a bit difficult for us, I think, to hear your concern and criticism or your concern for youth when there were was systemic and systematic and strategic uh, social media campaigns to get products in front of kids. Um, it's very difficult for me to understand. I, I am certain that all of you are have followed this information. I, I, I can't imagine that your companies don't. I can't imagine you'd be a CEO if you didn't. But when Johns Hopkins says from 2016 to 2018, um, the adult non-smokers that are now using e-cigarette products has doubled, that there's now six million people that you claim were not the target market audience for your products, that there's six million more customers that have come in that weren't the folks that supposedly, at least uh, uh, outwardly, people were marketing to. Then in a 2019 youth tobacco survey, a quarter of high school students had vaped in the last 30 days. And yet we're saying we're not marketing to them. <laughs> I think it's pretty hard to say that the consequence of the products that you have injected, of the, the, the ways in which you've gone about your businesses, haven't marketed to kids. And we've seen, Mr. Crossway, I understand that you're newly at the position. I understand that the previous executives might not have done things the way that you would have wanted, your company would have wanted, certainly I would have wanted. So we've seen a change there, but respectfully, what are you going to do to fix it? You can stop advertising now, you can stop putting up some of these bars, and I appreciate that, but we've now created an epidemic that is gonna be touching that today, a th quarter of all high school students, that the bars that you put up, I disagree a bit with Ms. Duncan's formulation of this, but he's not wrong, we now step in to regulate, you create incentives for a black market, kids are gonna go someplace else. Your company now is old news. And they're off to the next one because of an industry that you helped create. And there's quotes in the New York Times from people in your company that have said that that was, in fact, never really the objective. And now you're before us saying, yeah, we're open to regulation. What are we going to do to stop this? What do I do? And if the concern is a black market and an evolution of new products that will come out that don't have the robust protections that you all are are um, now putting in place, would you pledge at this moment not to purchase one of those companies or acquire one of those companies or engage in those product sales? Mr. Crosswhite? We, are, we do not sell any of the... Will you not sell? Will you, not, will you pledge not to acquire a company that is engaged in, as you have put up bars, but there's new products out there from new companies that don't face that regulation, would you pledge not to acquire such a company with that, that engages in those practices? What we're focused on is submitting our PMTA. I have n we have no, no plans at this time to... So no plan, Mr. Oberlander? Could you repeat your question, please? Will you, will you pledge not to acquire a company that does not uh, currently abide by the practices that you say you abide by as they increase their own market share? We're not focused on targeting... Yeah. And so on a second non-answer, Mr. Nicola. I would fully pledge. Fully pledge. Mr. Um, Blonde. We don't have any intent to purchase any company. Mr. Lofton. We have no intent, but we will honor that we will always market responsibly. And so, given that we have now created this industry that has a younger generation that is now addicted, what do you want us to do about it? Mr. Crosswell. Congressman, I fully recognize that the opportunity for the millions of adult smokers who still use combustible cigarettes to have an alternative is at risk if we don't address this issue. And we are uh, focused on combating underage access because I know it puts it all at risk if we don't make progress here. But sir, taken, how do I trust what you say? <laughs> my actions so far since I've joined um, support our recognition that more needed to be done. So we've taken action and we recognize more needs to be done to turn this issue around. We have been successful converting millions of adults away from the most harmful form of tobacco use. And also recognize that's at risk if we don't continue to make progress. I yield back. Chair now recognizes Mr. Griffith for five minutes. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. I, I appreciate it. Uh, we heard testimony earlier from Dr. Nora Volko, this was at a previous hearing, that in December, the number of youth who were using the vaping products, were, there, was more, there were more youth using THC 
vaping products than nicotine vaping products. The youth vaping epidemic is a separate health concern from the e-cigarette vaping association lung injury uh, e-valley outbreak. The use of vitamin E acetate and THC has been strongly linked, linked to those lung illnesses. Is vitamin E acetate used in any of your brand's cartridges? We'll start with you, Mr. Crossway. Crossway. Uh, no, Congressman. No. No, sir. No, sir. No, sir. And um, do any of your, your, so none of your companies sell anything that contains uh, THC or is specifically designed to be used with THC products. Can I assume that to be correct? Correct. We do not. No, sir. No, sir. No, sir. No, sir. Now, can your products be adulterated so they can be used with THC products? Modified or changed? Do you know? Our products are not designed to be uh, changed or modified. They are uh, tamper resistant. Our products are also designed to be tamper resistant. Same answer, sir. Same answer, sir. Our products are pre-sealed cartridges. They can't get in them. Um, and what steps do you have or plan to take to prevent uh, somebody using your device with, with some kind of a knockoff uh, product that could be used with one of your devices? So we take steps when we see in the market uh, illegal products that come on uh, to work to get them removed from the market. Uh, there are pods out there that are, are, are not intended to be used with our device. When we see it, we try to get them off the market. To my knowledge, at this point in time, we don't have any counterfeit or illicit products actually for our views products. Does anybody have we a different answer? We constantly monitor the market. Thank you. Does anybody have a different answer? No, sir. Okay. Um, you know, it's interesting because I had some folks who own vape shops come in to see me recently, and what they said was, look, we, we want people to come in and inspect us. We want them to see that we're using the right products, that we're not selling anything that's contraband or has been smuggled into the country or that has THC when it's not, you know, not supposed to be there, and we don't sell those products. Um, and would you all agree that it's, it's important that we have regulations, but that we also make it possible for there to be outlets for adults to go to vape shops instead of being bought on the, the street corner uh, from some renegade company. All right, so we completely support the FDA process and believe it is the most appropriate body to provide oversight for this industry and, in fact, to preserve the chance for adults to have access to alternatives to combustible cigarettes. And does anybody else have a, a different answer or something they'd like to add to that? Mr. Law At Logic, we don't believe it's gone far enough. We think all products and all companies should go through the same process. All right, I appreciate that. And I also understand that uh, some, of, some of you make a zero nicotine product. Can you explain why and for what purpose a nicotine-free EVP might service? That would be a vaping product for those who are watching at home. No nicotine. We do, not have, we do not make that product. You don't make that product. Do you all make that? Does anybody else make that product? At this point in time, we don't have it. We are considering it. No, sir. Okay. Yeah, we do. Um, Tell me about it. In, in, in some cases, uh, some smokers have evolved their way of uh, taking nicotine. And uh, at Blue, we, we want to offer a full range of nicotine. And they still want to have the, the feel of having something in, in their mouth or something that they're breathing in? Is that what, yeah, what as, causes that? As in my opening statement, I mean, some, some of our adult consumers decide to, to keep their uh, pleasure, pleasurable experience with our product, uh, but without nicotine. Lofton, do you all have a product like that? No, sir. Okay. Well, very good. Uh, my time is just about up, but I appreciate you. Will the gentleman yield me? I'll the yield you time? my 37 seconds. Yes, Mr. Blonde, what, what percentage of your sales are the no nicotine e-cigarettes? I don't have a, a precise number, but it's, 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 quite, uh, it's quite low. Quite low. Could you supplement your answers with the exact number? Uh, I would be happy to. Thank you that. so much. Thank you. You're I welcome. yield back. I yield back. Chair now recognizes Ms. Castor for five minutes. Well, thank you, Madam Chair, for calling this important hearing today. Uh, it's really highlighted how e-cigarettes and vape manufacturers have enticed young people uh, to their products, and I'm particularly concerned about companies marketing through social media uh, to target. It's an insidious use of social media to target young people and it's continued to happen even after 
uh, the harm has become clear to, to young people, the addictive nature, the impact on the developing brain, among other health impacts. Mr. Crothway, prior to reforming your social media marketing efforts in November 2018, a large number of the Juul social media followers were young people. In fact, according to the Journal of American Medical Association Pediatrics, almost half of your Twitter followers were aged 13 to 17. Uh, you testified here today that you should never, uh, Juul should never be marketed to youth, but they were extensively marketing to youth in the past. I assumed that Juul addressed its social media presence because it was concerned about how its social media activities did impact youth. Is that correct? It was before I joined the organization when the company stopped in social media uh, activity. And, and what we're actually focused on today with social media is getting posts off. So we look for posts that we think are inappropriate. We ask them to be taken down so that uh, the, the access to this type of information is not available. So Mr. Bonde, you just heard Mr. Crossway uh, state that they have a strategy, uh, the social media strategy, but they acknowledge that social media does impact youth use of the vapes as a major, major player in the industry. Uh, Fontam continues to use social media as a marketing tool. On one hand, you've said here today, boy, you're, you have a, an access program, you're trying to do everything you can to, to discourage, but on the other hand, you continue to actively market to, to you through social media. Why do you do that? We, we do not market to youth in, in any shape or form. Well, one aspect of Fontem's social media activity I'm concerned about is the use of the social media influencers, uh, underage youth who may be blocked from your social media accounts still can go to YouTube and uh, see your posts that promote your product. The influencers' promotion of these products is especially harmful because the popularity of the influencers, the individuals, can sway young people into believing that the products are attractive and they're trendy. Uh, will you commit here today to end your use of influencers to market uh, the vapes to young people? We have currently uh, stopped uh, producing any content from those influencers. Um, what have you done to, to actively uh, then end the influencers' use, the, the use on YouTube uh, we, of all of those videos? We, we have uh, very strict measures as, um, as far as, as, as it, it, it pretends to social media. Uh, we believe social media is, is an accepted platform of communication for our adult smokers. It's a, I mean, what social media is and the use of the influencers now, it makes it very difficult to control the dissemination of those market of the marketing information, Mr. Crothway, uh, do you think that e-cigarette, the e-cigarette industry as a whole, should end its use of social media as a marketing tool, given the difficulty in preventing youth from being exposed to this material, influencers included? What I've been focused on as CEO since I've joined is taking every step I believe uh, I can. To minimize Is that a to yes or getting access no? to we're, we're not on social media i stopped actually all of our uh, advertising. you're the market leader now what would you say to these other ceos who are, who are not taking not going down the same path i can just share what i have been focused on which is addressing uh, youth getting uh, any really access to uh, to information that they should not and that's why i've taken the steps i have as ceo uh, mr lofton do you use influencers we do not use influencers. Mr. Nimikov? No, ma'am, we do not use influencers. Mr. Oberlander? We do not use social influencers. Uh, so, Mr. Blanda, you're the odd man out here. Uh, again, I mean, uh, the, the use of influencers, as far as we're concerned, the choice of influencers is making sure that all people that we are interacting to are above 25 and look above 25. Well, it's not and good enough in today's uh, age of social media, you've got to be proactive and you've got to control. If you're not, if you say on the one hand, I'm not going to market to youth and uh, on the other hand, you're allowing the dissemination of videos and influencers on those platforms, you're, you're really uh, being hypocritical and uh, it needs to be brought under control. We understand how harmful these products are. 
uh, you have a responsibility, especially with the growing harm, the growing evidence of the health impacts to young people, not to market to them. Uh, I yield back my time. Uh, gentlelady from New Hampshire, Ms. Custer is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairwoman DeGette, and thank you for holding this very, very important hearing. L let me just start by saying, as a mother of two sons, I spent the last 30 years trying to keep them from smoking cigarettes. And instead, you've come into our life with nicotine that is highly addictive. So I want to just say, based on the data, that we are on the precipice of minimizing tobacco's hold on our Nathan's use, but confronting alarming rates of youth nicotine use. As a result, e-cigarettes are now the most commonly used tobacco product among youth, surpassing the rate of youth use of conventional cigarettes five years ago. In fact, e-cigarette use among youth doubled again from 2017 to 2019, demonstrating that this problem is only getting worse. And in my home state of New Hampshire, the Department of Health and Human Services estimates that at least a quarter of high schoolers are using vaping products, and those numbers are on the rise. Now, Dr. Sue Tansky, who was before this committee recently, a pediatrician from Dartmouth-Hitchcock, has helped us to understand this very issue. Based upon her testimony, sworn under oath, we know that biologically, the brain is more susceptible to nicotine addiction during adolescence. Late adolescence begins around 18, and for most lasts well into the 20s. A brain that is not exposed to psychotropic drugs such as nicotine during adolescence is less likely to develop addiction. My state is in the throes of the worst opioid epidemic in our lifetime that began with misleading marketing and lack of regulatory oversight. And my fear is that we are repeating those same mistakes and making way for a new generation grappling with addiction that we all fought to avoid. So I just want to say 26 years ago, we had tobacco company CEOs sitting in this room testifying before this committee that they did not believe that nicotine in their cigarette products was addictive. Four years later, the CEOs were forced to admit to the risk of nicotine in another hearing before this committee. Today, schools around the country warn students about the harms of nicotine, particularly on developing brains. Mr. Crothright, Juul offers a 5% nicotine content pod, which the company claims releases an amount of nicotine similar to a pack of 20 cigarettes. Some young users report going through a single Juul pod in three hours. To try to reduce their nicotine intake, these young people are now turning to combustible cigarettes to reduce their nicotine intake. Are you aware of reports of e-cigarette users so highly addicted to your products that they feel the need to switch back to regular cigarettes? And if so, do these reports concern you? Congressman, I share your concern about the amount of youth getting access to e-vapor. It's unacceptable, and we must work to combat it. What is it that you're doing about it today? So since I've joined the company about four months ago, we took action to address the, this issue. So we stopped shipping when I became a CEO in November. Our mint product, which at the time we got the data that youth were getting access to mint, and that was 70% of our company at that time frame. 70%? going to youth for no, nicotine no. addiction. No, 70% 70 70 of your profits were from this product that youth were using. Is that the number you're trying to explain to us? No, just to clarify, when we stopped shipping mint in November, at that time of all of our sales, that product was 70% of our business. That's what I'm trying to say. I mean, for the American people, 70% of your product was going to youth in our country. And four months ago, you stopped that practice? So in November, when I saw that youth were getting access to mint flavors and found it appealing, I took it off the market uh, for our company. What about the other flavors that are currently on the market? So today we sell uh, tobacco and menthol in the company. Menthol e-cigarette? Yes, in the U.S. market. And do you think that's getting access to youth? 
Well, we paid very close attention to the data when we made Is the there any reason not, not to take that off the market? Well, today there are over 10 million Americans who use menthol combustible cigarettes. How many youth? <clears throat> When we saw the data, uh, menthol was not one of the uh, leading flavors that youth were getting access to. How many the number youth? was quite small. I believe, in my recollection is I believe the number was a few percentage points, but I'll have to refer back to the report specifically. My time is up. I just want you to know mothers and fathers across this country are watching this hearing very carefully. Thank you. Chair now recognizes the ranking member of the full committee, Mr. Walden, for five minutes. Thank you again, Madam Chair, for having this hearing. And as I mentioned in my opening statement, I'm, I'm concerned about the counterfeit products, among other things, and the safety issues they present in the e-cigarette space. There are plenty of news articles about seizures of counterfeit jewel products in particular. I understand the FDA's Office of Criminal Investigations has several ongoing criminal investigations related to counterfeit jewel products that are unrelated to the lung injury investigation. So for each of you, and pretty quickly, what concerns do you each have about the counterfeiting of your product? I don't think your mic's on. Excuse me. Uh, counterfeit products are, are an issue. It's something we've been very focused on in the United States market, okay. getting them off of the marketplace. All right. Mr. So Oberlander. Uh, Mr. Congressman, at this point in time, we haven't seen any counterfeits of used products, but we are constantly monitoring the markets, to my knowledge. All right. We've not seen any reports of counterfeits of our okay. products. We don't see any report of counterfeit product. We're very concerned about counterfeit. And in fact, I'd love to show, share some of our results by working with FDA, Homeland Security, CBP, and local law enforcement. All right. Oh yeah, if you want, real quick. We have, through the help of everyone and that I just mentioned and all the, the uh, outside agencies, factory, we closed the factory in China, shipping in. We also had eight seizures last year, just in the U.S. in 2019. $1.5 million worth of product confiscated in wow. Nassau County in New York. 681 cease and desist. 1,859 okay. unauthorized online All sellers. Right. If, if I could get that from you, I, I've got a couple other questions I want to get to, but I, I appreciate you've answered the question well, but I'd like to get the, the full data Absolutely. set from you. Mr. Crothway, I want to go back to you to make sure I understood your answer to Ms. Custer. Did you say 70% of Juul's profits are, are uh, come from youth mint use? I don't think that's what you were saying, right? No, no, Congressman. What I was saying is when we saw the youth data that right. came out and that youth were getting access to mint, we stopped shipping that in the United States. And when we stopped shipping mint in the United States, at that time, it was 70% of what the company sold in the United States. To all users, not just youth. Correct. Okay. All right. Um, I want to, a few months ago, the entire industry, in, in just a few months, I mean, the entire industry is going to undergo yet another shift when the PMTA uh, filing deadline passes. After May 12th, only products for which a PMTA has been submitted can remain on the market. So the question I have is, how will a consumer or retail store owner know which products are allowed on the market after this date and which ones should be removed? What kind of transparency should we be thinking of? Do we need to do something here uh, once, once that process is, is completed? Uh, Mr. Crothway, anybody want to take that? Just, yes. Sure, Go sir. ahead. Yep. Sure. Uh, we, we look forward to submitting our PMTA uh, in May and to be in that process, which we think is a very important step for the industry uh, to go through, for the FDA to review these right. products. And of course, that whatever way we need to be communicating about our status in that process, we'll do so. But to the retailers and to consumers, Correct. how will they know yeah. things are left behind? Mr. Congressman, as I mentioned in my oral statement, it's paramount that actually the FDA gives full transparency of all products that have submitted PMTAs so that retailers, enforcement agencies, and the FDA actually have full visibility about which products are eligible to remain in the market or not. Okay. Norman? Uh, sir, I can't speak to my competitors. However, our products are almost exclusively sold in highly compliant tier one channels with uh, corporate counterparties that um, have fairly robust compliance <laughs> groups within their stores. And as a result, <clears throat> with respect to our products, I don't think there will be any confusion. Got it. Uh, we strongly encourage the um, and support the PMTA process. We intend to submit all of our dossier to the the uh, FDA by May, and, um, and and I agree that we strongly support the fact of full transparency to make sure only reliable actors retain the market. Right. Mr. Lofton? We strongly agree with the PMTA process. In fact, we're in sustained review and working with them right now. All right, perfect. Um, now this, uh, this issue with uh, uh, cannabis, THC, whatever, vitamin E, 
what are, what's the best thing we can do here to put a stop to that? Because that's some of where the lung injury is occurring. Um, state like Oregon that's legalized everything, we're seeing this. Any of you want to weigh in on what the best, best course of action for Congress to do to deal with that issue? I think you add all products and all companies involved in that under the PMTA process as well. Okay. Does that get at it? I believe the FDA has a discretionary power, an enforcement power, actually, to understand the root cause of the situation, actually go after the, the culprits in this crisis. All right. And the benefit of a PMTA process is you have preclinical, clinical behavioral research. For us, for example, we'll have 100 scientific studies submitted so the FDA can fully evaluate a product and determine if it's appropriate uh, for the protection of public health. All right. My time's expired. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you to all of you for your testimony. Thank the gentleman. Chair now recognizes Mr. Ruiz for five minutes. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you all for being here. Everyone here agrees that youth should not be using vaping products, but it is still happening at disturbing rates. That's why this committee accepted my bill, the No Vape Act, when we marked up the Reversing the Youth Tobacco Epidemic Act, the No Vape Act would increase penalties on retailers who sell vape products to underage teens. I'm also working on legislation to require manufacturers to label the vaping products, not just the packaging, to make it clear that nicotine in vaping is addictive and harmful to health. I'm a doctor, I know that. And to make it clear for parents and teachers to identify vaping products. It would also prohibit the sales of products that are clearly being used to attract teens with the ability to easily conceal their use, like this sweatshirt. The thread in the hood is the vaping product. Or these vaping products disguised as juice boxes. Juice boxes. Who else are products like these marketed toward but underage youth? These are egregious tactics that companies have employed to attract and addict youth to their products. And we must stop it. Mr. Lofton, in your testimony, you link the dramatic increase in youth usage of e-cigarettes to the combination of, quote, irresponsible marketing and product characteristics of other e-cigarettes. Can you describe the marketing tactics and product characteristics you think are driving youth use, including the companies that are or were engaging in these practices? Sir, I'm not here to talk about the other companies, but I will tell you it's based on irresponsible marketing. Exciting, like what? Exciting colors. You don't have to name companies, but give me examples exciting of irresponsible colors, exciting marketing. Exciting colors, exciting shapes, exciting names, parties, all kinds of different things without warning labels. It's all about the atmosphere of having fun, and it shouldn't be marketed to youth. So despite companies' attempts to address public concerns about their marketing, we know that youth continue to be targeted. In guidance published just last month, the FDA stated that e-cigarettes, quote, continue to be marketed to minors through a wide variety of media and technology. Mr. Crosswaite, in your testimony, you state that Juul has, quote, halted our broadcast, print, and digital product advertising. Do you believe that the e-cigarette industry should be subject to the same advertising restrictions as combustible cigarettes? If not, why not? Congressman, I share your concern about youth getting access to e-vape. Should they be held under the same standards as cigarettes? I took the steps that in the company because I felt it was critical to limit any sort of awareness uh, to tools like we were using. Their addictive products, should they be held to the same standards as smoking cigarettes? I think the FDA is going to have complete oversight over marketing practices. I chose okay. to take the steps we did because I felt significant action needed to happen to address this issue. All right. So we know that e-cigarette manufacturers have also marketed their products through various promotions, such as highlighting the affordability and various flavors of their products. Certain promotions caught our eye. After the FDA 
announced its recent guidance, Reynolds and Fontem began online promotions to sell flavors affected by the new policy. Reynolds' website banner promotion, for instance, stated, quote, Last chance to buy vapor flavor packs. Last chance to get your flavored packs. And the homepage of Fontem's website for its blue products feature a promotion for a, quote, last chance flavor blowout to, quote, stock up on selected liquid pods flavors before they're gone and, quote, buy 10 products, get 10, 15 free. It's very obvious that those who sell this product have their profit in mind when they're marketing to the public, not the public's health. Notably, both promotions excluded menthol and tobacco flavors, the two flavors excluded by FDA's flavor guidance. Mr. Blondet seems quite unabashed in its interest to cash in on flavors the FDA has deemed urgent to take off the market. Don't you think it's irresponsible of your company to offload your remaining stock of flavors in a fire sale at the same time FDA is sounding the alarm on the appeal of these products to youth? Um, the sales of our web, on our website are very strictly controlled and only accessible to 21 plus adults. So you're saying it's, it wasn't your decision. You're not taking accountability for the fact that while the FDA says let's remove flavors, you're trying to sell your flavors and market these flavors that Mr. Lofton said would be considered as an irresponsible act of marketing and characteristics of a product. We have several promotions on our website and this one was dedicated to our adult consumers currently enjoying those flavors and making sure that they could stock them before uh, well, they would be back clearly flavors has been a target for youth. So you can say the adults, but clearly it's been a cause for the youth epidemic. Yield back. Gentleman yields back. Ge gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Sarbanes is recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you uh, to the panel. So I, I understand that the, the, the premise of the product um, that you keep pointing to largely is to cure um, cigarette addiction and move people off of cigarette addiction. Uh, but when you look at the societal impact, it, it seems to me that the cure here may be worse than the disease because we've now created the next great uh, public health crisis, um, really of scandalous proportions. And it doesn't... Um, It's implausible that your companies didn't pick up pretty quickly that youth vaping was contributing significantly to the profitability of the bottom line. I don't know what the various cases out there have turned up yet, but I know that in years to come, we will um, see emails and memos and other things from the sales force going back and forth to headquarters, et cetera, uh, talking about the um, great opportunities to boost the numbers from certain kinds of sales. You knew it was happening. <clears throat> and it wasn't until this got to crisis proportions and there was a public outcry that the accountability uh, kicked in. So that's something that your industry is going to have to live with, and unfortunately, it's something um, our youth are living with, and will be with them into the um, into the future. I wanted to talk a little bit about the FDA's decision because um, originally, you know, FDA announced that it would ban all flavored e-cigarette products. Hooray! Um, and public health experts. Um, were encouraged by that, children's advocates and medical. In a way, we couldn't believe it, that the president was moving there, he's going to push on the FDA to do it. It sounded almost too good to be true as a really forceful response um, to the crisis. And then, of course, it turned out it was too good to be true because when the policy ultimately came down, it was significantly weakened with exempting multiple e-cigarette um, products. So the question I keep asking myself is what happened? Why would the FDA, the agency that's tasked with regulating tobacco and has one of their key areas of focus protecting America's 
youth and ensuring a healthier life for every family. This is mission-oriented stuff. Why would they walk back their decision? And I just feel like it's got something to do with how money moves in Washington. So there's a report from the American public media that talks about the multi-million dollar campaign that Juul launched to push back on the government's efforts to restrict vaping. Juul hired an army of lobbyists spending almost $3 million on lobbying the federal government, more than doubling its lobbying expenses from 2017 and 2018 combined. The Political Action Committee reported spending $200,000 for candidates and committees, and Juul dramatically increased its spending in states to combat state-level efforts to restrict their products, reported 142 lobbyists registered in 48 states, then with the Citizens United case opening the floodgates on how dark money comes into um, our politics and into the policy-making apparatus up here, we saw companies like Reynolds American and Jewel Investor, I think 35% owner, Altria, using their deep pockets to influence the regulations Reynolds American donated millions of dollars to dark money groups like Americans for Tax Reform, Americans for Prosperity. Um, Altria spent $295 million on lobbying since 1998, more than ExxonMobil spent in the same time period. So the problem here is that this culture of responding to legitimate scrutiny around a, a public health crisis, responding by turning up your lobbying and money influence on the Hill, means that the priorities that the public wants to see are continuing to be frustrated because there's an inside game. And I just wanted to speak to that um, today. I didn't give anybody the uh, opportunity to respond, and I've now used my time. But I think it's a real concern and it's something that we need to shine a light on because the American public is, is frankly tired of it. And I yield back. The gentlelady from New York is recognized for five minutes. Ms. Clark. I thank you, Madam Chair. Um, gentlemen, over the past decade, our public health agencies have become increasingly concerned about the youth vaping rates, as have all of us. In 2013, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention first sounded the alarm on the increasing use of e-cigarettes among youth. And in 2018, the Food and Drug Administration declared youth vaping an, epi an epidemic. Yet the number of young people using e-cigarettes has continued to grow. Today, more than 5 million young people use e-cigarettes. Uh, Mr. Navkov, is e-cigarette use among youth a national public health threat? Yes, ma'am. The nation's leading public health officials point to the attractiveness of fruity and sweet flavors, targeted marketing tactics, stealth design, and low cost in explaining the appeal of e-cigarettes to youth. Mr. Lofton, your testimony, testimony attributes the rise in youth use primarily to, quote, youth appeal of certain products that seem to intentionally target minors, end quote. Mr. Lofton, which products do you believe intentionally target young people? Congresswoman, I'm not here to talk about the other companies, but I know it's irresponsible marketing with high, exciting flavors and colors and shapes and sizes that appeal to minors. And if they're doing that, they should stop. Well, you are a part of uh, an industry, sir. So uh, I don't know how much you all in interact with each other outside of being called here to uh, testify before us, but the whole industry uh, is basically under scrutiny right now. And uh, if you feel as though you have colleagues that are uh, unscrupulous in their practices, it would seem to me that the industry would have that conversation. Ms. Mr. Crosswaite, According to national survey data, nearly 60% of high schoolers and over half of middle schoolers who vape report Juul as their usual brand. Mr. Crothwaite, why are so many young people drawn to your products? 
So the, the Jewels had great success converting millions of adults who were using combustible cigarettes and otherwise wouldn't have quit. Hold on one moment. My question is, why are so many young people drawn to your product? Yeah, and with that success with adults and that social sourcing plays a role in how youth get access to e-vapor products, an unintended consequence of our success was youth getting access to Juul. So how many young people do you estimate were drawn into this because of the, the adult population that, that you're quoting? So when we saw the youth data that came out, clearly those numbers are unacceptable and too high. What were those numbers? The publicly available uh, numbers that- You don't data. know what the numbers are, sir? The, the studies that came out were the Monitoring the Future study that showed that youth were getting access to, to men- Yeah, but do you know what the numbers are? What did your study indicate, sir? They all indicated that the youth use was just too high. Mr. Oberlander, beyond pointing to the specific product, how, do we, how did we get here? What caused more than 5 million youth to start vaping? Madam Clark, first of all, I share your concern. I think the most important point I would like to remind you that- Can you pull the mic closer, sir? When Views was a market leader between 2015 and 2017, youth vaping rates declined. In the National Youth Tobacco Survey, I mean, from last year, actually showed that less than 5% of the respondents claim to have used views. Additionally, our consumer demographics for views products indicate that 95% of our consumers of views actually are 25 and older, and 70% of them are 35. So are you saying you just have no idea how these 5 million youth started vaping, sir? Yeah, frankly, we don't research you. You, you have we no idea. Excuse me, we have only researched 21 and, and plus individuals. Uh, turning back to you, Mr. Crossway, in your testimony, you mentioned that Juul is, quote, combating the serious problem of underage use. Yet, as discussed, youth, con youth, youth use continues to increase, and young people are still using your products in high numbers. You came to Juul from Big Tobacco which has not always been a stalwart of promoting public health. Why should we take your word for it when you say that Juul is serious about combating youth use of e-cigarettes? I joined the company because I believe in the historic opportunity for adults to have another option to combustible cigarettes who otherwise wouldn't quit. I also recognize that's at risk. If we don't solve this problem, the youth usage situation is unacceptable and when I joined, I took action, and we're prepared to do more over time. So as those responsible for perpetuating the practices that have so enticed young people to your products, I believe that your industry must be willing to take ownership over your actions and that have contributed to our nation's youth vaping epidemic. Each of you, though you try to differentiate what your companies are doing, are all collaborating uh, in an industry that is drawn in and will continue to draw in young people unless uh, you take affirmative actions in a, or unless we do so. I yield back, Madam Chair. Gentleman from New York, Mr. Tonko, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Crossway, for every person that gets off of a combustible cigarette, how many um, will get hooked or start using an e-cigarette? Um, uh, in other words, the addiction that might come to e-cigarettes for uh, young people, how many are we willing to tolerate? The youth rates are unacceptable, and uh, this whole opportunity for adults we recognize is at risk if we don't address this issue. I think we, there is that tipping point. I think we really need to take that into consideration. We do not want our young people to be the victims that uh, uh, will be uh, addicted, become addicted. Common sense and research show that flavored products are an on-ramp to youth e-cigarette use. According to an NIH and FDA national survey, nearly 80% of youth use the tobacco product because, and I quote, uh, it comes in flavors I like. Industry claims that flavored e-cigarettes are important to help some adult smokers quit, though whether these flavors are necessary to help a person quit smoking is yet unproven. So Mr. Crossway, between November of 18 and November of 19, uh, Juul voluntarily removed all of its flavored products except tobacco and menthol from the U.S. market. 
Was the increasing youth use of non-tobacco flavored products a factor in this decision? So when I joined the organization, and when we saw the data that youth were getting access to mint, it is that data that drove the decision I made, which was to take mint off the market for the company in November. And at our subcommittee hearing last fall, then acting FDA Commissioner Sharpless stated that the research is, and I quote, very strong that flavors drive a child to use. Um, Mr. Nibikoff, uh, do you agree with FDA that fruity and minty flavors play a role in attracting our youth to e-cigarettes? I, I think that Enjoy's data overwhelmingly demonstrates that um, flavors did not drive youth to our products. Enjoy is, has the lowest rate of youth use amongst the four major brands and has overwhelmingly by a multiple of greater than 30, the lowest rate of violations with FDA retail inspections, despite the overwhelming majority of our revenue previously being derived from flavors, albeit all flavors will be off the market as of tomorrow. Well, a, at the um, listening session um, that the White House held this past November, you told the president, and I quote, flavors are an issue, they are attractive to youth. So how does that coordinate or respond to the answer you just gave now? Uh, can you repeat that quote? I don't recall saying that, sir. Um, the quote from the White House um, listening session was, uh, and I quote, flavors are an issue, they are attractive to our youth. Are, are you certain that came from me? I, I, might be, I might have been speaking colloquially about the industry, but I think the data clearly demonstrates that flavors with respect to Enjoy's distribution, which is the only thing over which I exercise control, have not been a driver of youth use, as we are overwhelmingly the industry leader in avoiding youth use. Yeah. We, um, I have a document here that uh, has the transcript of the listening session that was held on November 22nd. And so that was a direct lift from that transcript. I, perhaps you could share the context because out of context, I, I, I don't fully understand what, what the comment is. But, but again, Enjoy is the overwhelming market leader despite having the overwhelming majority of our revenue derived from, from flavors. We have the lowest rate of youth use by any measurable benchmark afforded by the federal government. Again, the context was whether or not flavors are a driving force. Um, so we'll move on. A recent study of e-cigarette use among U.S. youth found the use of mint and menthol-flavored e-cigarettes increased sharply over the past three years. For Juul, it was reported that its mint products contributed 70% to its overall sales after it restricted the availability of its fruit flavors. I'm concerned that FDA's action to temporarily restrict certain flavored e-cigarettes does not go far enough because it exempts menthol products. FDA's website describes menthol as, and I quote, a flavor additive with a minty taste and aroma. So Mr. Crossway, uh, given the similarities between mint and menthol, do you believe it's possible that youth using mint e-cigarette products may just switch to those menthol products? I think it's important to note the differences today. We now have Tobacco 21 as the law of the land and our uh, menthol product is actually very different than our mint product. It is a tobacco-based formulation uh, that, that exists. But do you think it's possible that youth using mint will switch to the menthol product? We know that the FDA is certainly going to track it. We're going to do the same. And Mr. Uh, Oberlander, the same question to you. Are you convinced the menthol won't just become the new mint in terms of popularity among youth? Tobacco and menthol flavors have been not perceived by the FDA based on research to be popular amongst youth. However, we will continue to monitor the market and we encourage the FDA to do the same. Well, I'm disturbed by what we know of youth behavior and their likelihood to merely shift from using fruity and mint flavored e-cigarettes to menthol products. Unfortunately, I've not heard anything this morning to convince me this won't be the case. And with that, Madam Chair, I yield back. Thank the gentleman. The ranking member and I will now each uh, ask one last round of questions, and I'll recognize the ranking member, Mr. Guthrie, for five minutes. Thank you for that, and again, thank you for being here. No doubt, e-cigarettes must get out of the hands of our youth. And I want to ask each of you to, just to verify before we break today, are you committed to stopping all youth access, and will you commit to keep the committee updated as you take actions to stop usage of e-cigarettes? Mr. Crossway. 
We are committed to combating access uh, for youth getting to e-vapor, and we're happy to keep you up to speed on all of our actions. Thank you. Mr. Oberlander? Yes, we are committed. Mr. Nicko? Yes, sir. Mr. Bacall? Mr. Boyd? Absolutely, sir. Mr. We are committed in helping in any way. And, and then one final question. Um, you've all submitted PMTAs or indicated you plan to submit PMTAs, and that's important because in order to stay on the market, you have to submit PMTAs, and there seems to be a lot of products that aren't. That, that are on the market that aren't going down that direction. But currently, there is no final regulation from FDA on the PMTA process, including what information should be submitted and in what format. Do you think it would be helpful for the FDA to finalize this regulation before May 6th? And if it doesn't do it sooner rather than later, what setback will that cause to your process? Mr. Crossway, we can just go down the aisle. We are preparing to submit our FDAs. We have opportunities to engage with our regulator and get feedback on the process. Even without the final regulation, you're getting feedback to what you need to do without a final reg in place? We have our regulatory science organization that does engage with the FDA and, and to seek the appropriate information to make our filing. But would a final regulation be helpful? Sure, uh, any clarity is always helpful, but we're confident that we're gonna submit a, a, a fulsome application. Okay. Mr. Oberlander? We have submitted the first set of PMT applications for views products, and we will actually comply with the May 12th deadline to submit all others. But without a final regulation in place, you feel confident that you're able to? Continuous clarity, clarification about the process would be helpful for sure, I think. Mr. Nivikov? We think the current guidance is sufficient. So no final, you can submit without a final reg, so? We, we do plan to submit before a final regulation is promulgated. Certainly we would welcome any additional clarity, but we don't think it's a prerequisite. Okay, Mr. Blende? We could agree that we, we are in process of, of uh, finalizing our dossier for the PMT and submitting in date. Um, and we encourage everybody and all the market actors in the market should do so. Okay. Mr. Lofton? We've already submitted our PMTAs. We're in substantive review. We're working with them right now. We will work with them if any new regulations come up. Thanks. Well, my point is I knew you had to move forward because there's not enough time if you aren't moving forward to go from where we are today to have it by May the 6th. But I'm sure as, as the Oversight Committee FDA, we would... Uh, like to see FDA have a final regulation as you are moving for approval. We think that's the way the process should work. But we certainly understand you can't wait for that to happen, but we would like to, clarity is always important and following the process the way it should be followed is important to us as well. Well, thank you for being here. And I said, uh, we, we absolutely must get e-cigarettes out of the hands of our youth. And we'd like for you to update us as you put new, um, I think, controls in place, as Mr. Lofton said, as you, you shared with what you do, but as you move forward, we would like to see that as well. Thank you, and I yield back. Thank you. I thank the gentleman. I just have a couple quick questions. Um, one of the things that the kids at my roundtable earlier this week said is that that people are just getting uh, uh, e-cigarettes online now that the age has gone up to 21. Mr. Lofton, you said that you have very strict um, uh, online protections in, uh, before you'll send, send them out. Is that right? Yes, ma'am, it is. Could you, could you um, submit those for the record? We have so already that we sent that to the committee staff, but I'll okay, be glad great. to do it again Thank as you. Well. And do the rest of you all have very strict online protections? Mr. Blonde, you're nodding yes. Mr. Nevikoff? Yes, we do. Mr. Oberlander? Yes, we do. And Mr. Picasso. Okay, thank you. Uh, the second question that I had was, um, uh, E-cigarettes are being marketed as a smoking cessation tool, but partly because we haven't had a final guidance from the FDA, uh, uh, e-cigarettes are not approved by the FDA as a uh, smoking cessation tool. Isn't that correct, Mr. Crossway? Correct. We, we do not market today as a smoking cessation tool. Okay. But, but they're not approved by the FDA. Is that right? Right. Okay. Um, the next question I have, and, and I, I want to commend all of you for now realizing the extent of the problem, 5 million youth vaping, and I want to commend you all for try, trying to remove the marketing, but have you also tried to figure out ways that you can help contribute to um, ses, uh, uh, smoking cessation programs or other programs to help kids get off of this highly addicted substance. It's, it's one thing just to say we're not going to market to you anymore, but we already have millions of underage kids who've gotten addicted. What are we going to do about that? Mr. Oberlander, you, you seem to be nodding. Thank you. 
Uh, Chad, again, I think this is an important issue. And at yeah. Windows American, we have a youth tobacco prevention program called Right the Seasons Right Now, where we invest a significant amount of money behind. And only last year, we have 800 employees actually contacting schools, I mean, talking about the dangers and, and actually So you, you actually are, are trying to help kids get off of nicotine. Would that be accurate for Juul as well, Mr. Crossway? We're trying to make sure they don't get it in the first place. I understand. Access prevention, and the, the question you're raising is an important one, and we'd be happy to engage. So you're not doing, you don't have programs right now to try help, to help people get off of it? We're, we're not uh, doing programs. Thank you. Right what now. about you, Mr. Nivikoff? Ma'am, we would support any recommendations that Right, but that you're, the you're, not, you're not aware of any program you all have now? No, ma'am, we don't, we don't what think What about you, Mr. Blunday? No, we don't currently have programs, and we don't address Would youth. you be willing to consider something like that? We're happy to collaborate with the okay. committee and, and continue. Okay. Mr. Lofton? We're very open to working through that as well with the committee. You don't have any programs right Nothing now? Nothing specific. Okay. Um, I was, I, I'm going to be honest. Um, I was pleased that all of you admitted under oath that nicotine is addictive, but I was extremely dismayed when I asked you about the health problems with nicotine, that, that you all, were all extremely vague in your answers and seemed to say, well, you're doing studies right now, because it's actually been quite, um, it's, it's been established that nicotine itself has severe health risks. A um, report, I've got two reports that I had the staff go get me while we were sitting here, and they're surveys of the medical research. And the uh, Surgeon General says nicotine exposure during adolescence can cause addiction and harm the developing brain. But then it says, so these, these kids get addicted, then they're addicted. Nicotine can cross the placenta and has known effects on fetal and postnatal development. Therefore, nicotine d delivered by e-cigarettes during pregnancy can result in multiple <laughs> adverse consequences, including sudden infant death syndrome, and could resort, res result in altered corpus callosum, deficits in auditory processing, and obesity. It goes on to say, e-cigarettes can expose users to several chemicals, including nicotine, carbonyl compounds, and volatile organic compounds known to have adverse health effects. The health effects and potentially harmful doses of heated and aerosolized constituents of e-cigarette liquids, including solvents, flavorants, and toxicants, are not completely understood. And it goes on to say, e-cigarette aerosol is not harmless water vapor, although it generally contains fewer toxicants than combustible tobacco products. The Indian Journal of Medical and Pediatric Oncology, which was in 2015, so that was five years ago when we already knew this stuff, says nicotine poses several health hazards, uh, cardiovascular, respiratory, gastrointestinal disorders, uh, decreased immune response, and ill impacts on reproductive health, cell proliferation, oxidative stress, uh, um, apoptosis, DNA mutation, etc. And so I asked the staff, I'm going to put these studies in the record, but I also asked the staff to make a copy to give to each of you because I think you need to be aware that once these kids get addicted, then the nicotine is also going to have lifelong impacts as long as they stay addicted. I have one last question for you, Mr. Crossway, and I appreciate that you have said that uh, Jewel needs to get it right. And I appreciate the turning the page, looking forward. You said, for example, when you saw the youth data on the mint, you quit s shipping the mint because it was, it was um, an unacceptable level. So here's my question to you. Let's say the 2020 youth, National Youth Tobacco Survey does not show a decline in the rate of youth use of e-cigarettes despite all of the efforts that you and the other companies and Congress and the, and the administration in raising the age to 21 have taken, would you then uh, consider suspending the sales of all of your products until health officials can figure out how we can stop this youth vaping epidemic? Well, in just a few short months, we're gonna have our PMTA in with the FDA who will have all of the information to make the determination if, in fact, our product is appropriate 
for the protection of public health. And that, that's the process we think is best to, to make that determination. Well, I'm glad you're going through that process. I'm glad everybody's going through that process. But my question is, will, if, if the number of youth vaping doesn't go down despite all of this, with the effort you've taken already, would you stop marketing your e-cigarettes until we figure out how to solve this epidemic? Well, I've stopped all of our broadcast, print, and digital marketing okay, so, so, already. So you're, you're not prepared to go as far as what I'm suggesting. Wouldn't that be fair to say? We have taken serious actions to address this issue, and we're prepared to do more as we go on. Okay, but stopping sales altogether until we figure it out, that's not what you're thinking about. We're trying to preserve this opportunity for the millions of adults while combating underage issue that exists, and ultimately we're going I got, to- I got gotcha. you. You don't want to answer it. I got gotcha. you. Uh, but I do really want to thank you for coming, and I want to thank all of the witnesses for their participation in this hearing. We have um, a number of documents that we want to put into the record. We already put Representative Duncan's article into the record. We have the 2015 study from the Indian Journal of Medical and Pediatric Oncology I just referred to. We have the letter to the committee from the National Association of the County and City Health Officials. We have the New York Times article that Congresswoman Schakowsky referred to, and this 2016 Surgeon General report on the dangers of nicotine. I'd ask unanimous consent that all of those be put in the record, so ordered. I also want to remind, mem remind uh, members that pursuant to the committee rules, they have 10 business days to submit additional questions for the record to be answered by the witnesses. And if the witnesses could answer those questions, we would very much appreciate it. Um, and with that, the subcommittee is adjourned. Oh, yeah, out there.